All right. Uh, nice to meet you. My name is Weldon. This is um, Justin, and we are here today to present to you an uh, interview into the sports psychology of high performance World of Warcraft player versus player game mode. So the reason there's so many caveats there is because World of Warcraft has so many competitive uh, modes in it that are both like person versus person and person versus environment and person versus person versus environment <laughs> or versus environment versus other people. Um and uh and and for the last few weeks i've been kind of like um talking to people who are more on the uh competitive version of speed running which is like the person versus environment and um when i've been doing pvp i've been watching justin here is like my main educator um and he's a uh, as he'll explain in a bit a very high ranked um like gladiator player in PvP. And I've noticed a lot of the same kind of stressors and anxieties that come up when I play ranked matches in, for example, League of Legends or in Valorant. Uh, like the anxieties that come up when you're trying to clutch um, or when the whole game is on your back because everybody else died uh, or when you're just trying to push the play button and queue up, you know, uh, in the first place with a, you know, with a stranger who's, whose ranking is on the line because of your performance. Uh, and so I wanted to talk a bit about that aspect of the game, as well as just um, this, the coaching sciences or the sports sciences side of, of high performance PvP, because it's, it's quite different from uh, player, like the, the raiding and the Mythic Plus dungeon running in World of Warcraft, even though it is the same game and the same kind of control scheme. So nice to meet you and thanks for joining me today. Thanks for having me. I really, really do appreciate it. Um, so... I was I was talking to you a little bit before the call about like the league ranking system and the and the WoW ranking system and you mentioned you didn't play yeah. league but what is your history with other games is World of Warcraft like your first uh, game that you played or the first game that you were like really really good at or how has it been yeah. for you I mean I've been playing video games pretty much my whole life um, I think it started when I was a kid my mom would stay up super late at night and play Donkey Kong on Nintendo sixty four. And uh, Majora's Majora's Mask Zelda. Yeah, yeah, that was or, the N64 yeah. one. Yep, yeah, N64. And I would, my mom would, I'd have to wait for her to go to sleep, start playing it. But I would start playing it, and then I moved in middle school, and you know, middle school, moving especially, I didn't have many friends when I first moved. But there was one kid who was like, you know, it's, you know, we were friends, and introduced me to WoW in middle school, and I've been playing it ever since, like since. 2007 so going on 14 years and then i also play hearthstone so pretty much blizzard games so did you did when you were playing other games did you did you you never took a break from wow you just kind of just only been playing wow or did you like step off and play another one and step on or are so, you able to play two games at the same time like yeah i i am legend in hearthstone now um I the only time I ever took a break from WoW I was kind of forced to do uh, was in college in MOP, which was right when Miss Weaver came out. I was uh, the peak times of Miss Weaver, but I I for I I had to take a break because I got a concussion from wrestling. So I was an all American wrestler in college, and I got a concussion, and I wasn't taking it that serious. <clears throat> and then I had to take it serious, so I I did have to quit for most of MOP, maybe the second half of MOP. But that's the only time I've ever taken a break from WoW. And um, were you always doing like the competitive aspects of the game, or or were you playing? Like, was there a moment in your playing of this like RPG where mm -hmm. it, for you it became like something clicked and like the the competitive aspect became enticing to you, or have you always been? I mean, you mentioned you did wrestling at a yeah. high level, so like. Has it always been just a facet of your personality that you are pursuing, you know, these kind of like mastery related things and you just have to try to compete and be better at it? That it's just pers part of my personality that I actually, I like it, but I hate it at the same time. Like always trying to be the best. Um, yeah, because I was also, I varsity cross country, um, all state soccer, uh, lacrosse goalie. So sports and competitiveness has always been kind of part of who I am. And it's the same for WoW. Um, I don't think I could play for fun. I, I mean, it is fun, but I am extremely competitive. So I'll always, no matter what I do, I'll always try. I'll always try to be the best. Yeah. Yeah, I've noticed. Um, so I started like surveying people who 
I guess, who came across my content around 2014 mm. and onward. And I noticed pretty quickly then that that there were like two different ways of experiencing video games. Like I had friends who would just play one game in the morning and a different game in the afternoon and a different game at night. And they took their enjoyment and their satisfaction and their entertainment from actually playing the game. Like the story, mm-hmm. you know, kind of like a movie, like you'd watch a movie for or read right. a book. Okay. Um, and and I was like, wow, that's really weird because I couldn't ever, ever, <laughs> yeah. ever, ever, ever do that in a million years. Like <laughs> yeah. my joy from the video game comes from having a skill that I'm worse at and then being better at it like slightly yeah. later, like this mastery step up process. And yeah. sometimes that's against the world when it's a well-designed game. And sometimes that's against other people, you know, when it's mm-hmm. a, a competitive game. Um, but I think that like, it sounds like for you, games are an expression of your competitive aspect completely. And and you would just go yeah. read the book if you wanted to disappear into a fantasy Definitely. world. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I, that's exactly it. I, I really don't, I couldn't play a game for fun. I don't think because I came here, watch streams without. So the reason I started to push legend and Hearthstone was because I was watching like, I think it was like the grandmaster tour, which is their tournaments. And for some, I'm just like, I, if these guys can do it, why can't I? So then I just, I just got legend of Hearthstone. I don't know. That's, I, that's just where my mind goes to when I watch people or play video games. If, if these people can do it, why, why can't I? So I just try I, even now, uh, mythic plus I was watching the, um, MDI tournament, the, the, and these people, these players are insane. And I said, man, these, these people are time and keys like 20, 22s. And I said, if, if they can do it, why can't I? So now I've timed, I think a twenties on, in every single dungeon. Just, I don't know. That's just where my mind goes to when it comes to video games or pretty much anything. Yeah. I, um, I was, I was thinking about like well, now I kind of got caught up in your story and I lost my train of thought. I tried to like go fuck in there, but you like swept me up. Oh, it was about the Hearthstone thing. Uh, yeah. I was speaking of like the skill profile of different games. There mm-hmm. was this um, famous story when Hearthstone like had its first tournament. Uh, they were in Europe. Uh, maybe this didn't like get in a lot of American press, but there was a yeah. journalist who went to cover it. Uh, and the, and these were like, esports had the moniker at the time of being like young because I think mm-hmm. most of the esports were like CSGO. Um, right, you know, Legends, yeah. uh, StarCraft, and and it was like once you're 20, you're kind of out of the scene. So all <laughs> these Hearthstone players were, at the time were like 14 to 18 years old, and this yeah. journalist was like 26, and he got there and he was like, "Why am I covering this event?" And he enrolled <laughs> in it and he got third place. Oh my god! <laughs> and, he, and 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 thus began the conversation of like, well, some esports are different. Like some are like card games, like yeah. the Gathering or Hearthstone, where there's no reaction speed, right? It's like a, right. you need to have this competitive like card counting style of like, yeah. strategy, right? Yeah. And the b- ability to predict kind of what you're, what's going to be played and what the dangers are and how to counter them. Um, and then, and then there's the reaction based sports, which like CSGO. Yeah. And then there's the mixtures like League of Legends, which require, you know, kind of like damage pre- prediction. So you need to have a lot of knowledge and repetitions in, but then you need mm-hmm. to have like the click accuracy. So, if you think if you think of like your journey right now from PvP into Mythic Plus, um, mm-hmm. let's specifically keep it in WoW. Like, what is your perception of the different difference in skill required to do PvP compared to <sighs> okay. maybe compared to other WoW esports, but also just compared okay. to like esport in general? Yeah. Um. So in PvP, the main difference is you need to know everything that's going on in the game not just you in like a vacuum not just your abilities your rotation you need to know well this is from a healer point of view as well not a dps point of view so from a healer point of view i have to track i need to know my teammates defensives their offensive cooldowns because i need to line up crowd control with the other team um and then on the other side on the enemy team i need to know their burst cooldowns because i need to be able to react to what they're doing and then I need to know their defensives to call it out for my team and to react to their defensives and you need and everything in between, like their crowd control, you need to predict what they want to do and how you're going to react to it. So, for example, um, like a balanced druid, uh, they have root beam, which is like their main setup, their silence. As a monk, you have Zen Focus T. So you kind of want to try to Zen Focus T their silence because you could dispel the root. And that completely negates the balance druids goes. So 
there's a lot of you need to know everything that's going on in the arena uh, for Mythic Plus. All right, so so you mentioned oh, this you knowledge can... aspect, but mm-hmm. but and you mentioned it on stream by the way, the ability to like cancel out uh, the hunt with the diffuse magic. Yeah, yeah, or, with or revival now this root beam with Zen Focus T. So yeah, so I go into a game and I try to do that. Yeah, we're using the knowledge that you provided, but it doesn't right. happen. Yeah, so I, what, what, you're missing a skill profile there. I feel like of like actually you were able to do it when you try to do it. Is that just yeah. an accident that you like think that you're like okay, I, I should do this, and then you try it and you do it, and you don't realize that other people aren't that fast or can't do I, it, or or did you practice a bit before you practice get a lot? Enough? Yeah, definitely. Pra- I mean, I've lost a lot of games. Like, I've lost a lot of games to losing like that. It just comes down to it's so. It, it, it depends on the situation, but you can you can kind of tell when they're pushing in. Like if the balance shoot is on the other side of the map, and you're on the other side of the map, and then you see him pushing in, he's pushing in to try to get a root beam on you, so you can kind of predict it. Um, and then if they're trying to set up a kill, they're normally going to try to crowd control one of your other teammates. So it's 3v3, they're probably going to stun the kill target, CC my other DPS, silence me. So if I see kind of some kind of CC on... My other DPS, that means they're going to try to silence me, so that's when I press them focus T and hope, really, at that point, that they don't see it. But, yeah. Is is there an element similar to Super Smash Brothers Melee where you are trying to land your immunity during frames of their cast animation for their ability? In World yeah. of Warcraft, when they cast something, is there like a point of no going back where they have to cast it, but you still have time to react? Or is it all uh, just like baiting and, and hoping that they it, that they are it's already mostly tra- fingers already it's in most, action? Yeah, it's mostly trading cooldowns. As soon as they press a button, you kind of react. But there are situations like revival with Peace Weaver that makes everyone on your team immune to magical effects. If I see a mage halfway through a polymorph and I feel like it's on me, I'll press it, and it'll most of the time it's immune. Sometimes they'll notice it, but they really don't notice it a lot of the times. But for the most part, it's trading cooldowns. Because most of, I, I don't know about you, but I run into a lot of melee cleaves, so they don't even have a lot of cast of spells, so it's a lot of trading rather than like mid-cast. Got it. And and for Root Beam and Zen Focus T, it's not like you're watching the Druid's character for an animation and then trying to get it in there like right yeah. in time. It's more like you kind of know it's coming, and so you just trade the cooldown and then... Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and, exactly. and probably on his team, some of his offensive players have already popped their cooldowns and you know they started yeah. to go so like it's like the whole team is just all in or all out it's not reacting yeah. to whether or not you zen focus t and then they cancel everything yeah exactly and okay. if you zen focus t and they don't root beam but they already press their offensive cooldowns you kind of like delay the cc so it's kind of staggered and gives us time to react to what they're doing so mm-hmm. delaying is also good too so there is like a there there is there any of the Super Smash Brothers uh, style of of training where you're actually looking at the character model and trying to react to certain like animations, or is that um, is that like a level of PvP, or is that is that encompassed under other classes besides like Miss Weaver healing? Yeah, uh, or so does that you not can... happen in World of Warcraft at all. It, for the animations that are obvious, like Pally wings that are extremely obvious, they're glowing yellow and they have wings and they're going crazy. Yeah, it's able to re- easy to react to that. Uh, Rogue kidney shot is also kind of easy to react. They do like a kind of punch animation, so you can kind of tell when that's coming. Um, warriors have Warbreaker where, and they smash the ground, so it's able to, to be able to. to cause, so that's a forty-five second cooldown. If you're a Mist Weaver, you can disarm it. Um, but yeah, those are oh, and combustion where the mage is literally on fire. Yeah. So the, yeah, so the ones are that are like, obvious, these are kind of like tells, so like visual, yeah. kind of like coding. Okay, right, yeah, yeah. And, but you have your interface also for for like explaining, Ex- what's yeah, add ons, yeah, which is really so different from easy. like League of Legends where you just have to memorize the the like visual tells in the game because the, mm-hmm. you can't program up like an icon to pop up when it's happening. Be- before Shadowlands, I never really had things pop up. Because oh. you had kind of times to react. You had time to react. But phew, the damage is so high right now. If you don't react within maybe half a second, you're probably just going to die. It's hmm. Especially fire mages and warriors. Rep, and pal, rep pallies as well. Yeah. All right. So I kind of interrupted you when you were going into comparing it to M plus then. So I'll... Oh. Mythic plus. I'll oh, Mythic plus. Oh, no. You're good. Um, <laughs> mythic plus... Uh, so I've been pushing keystones and it seems like a lot of players they're they're very aware of what they do 
and like their damage rotation and what the boss does and the mobs, but they can be very unaware of everyone else's abilities. Like I've seen tanks that won't use my ring of peace when they're trying to kite, they won't use it. Um, I've seen people run out of darkness when a demon hunter uses it. So like they're really good at their class and they understand the dungeon and raid because I'm mythic raid too, but kind of un like unaware of everyone else's abilities essentially. Except maybe how it relates to them, like right exactly. If, if there's like specific one to ones, like blessing of sacrifice or something. Right. Okay. Yeah. So so again, it's like heavily on the knowledge component, which I feel like yeah. has always been a big part of World of Warcraft. Mm -hmm. Even with raiding, it's like you go in and you have to figure out like the timings you want to do of everything, and that's kind of how you get better at a boss fight is all of the different, yeah. you know, maximizing all your timings across the raid. Interesting. Yeah, that, that's one of my favorite things about mythic raiding, though. I, I don't even do it much for the loot. I just do it for the challenge of it and uh, kind of killing the boss. And yeah, we just killed Mythic Painsmith. I don't know if you've ever seen the fight. Mm -hmm. But yeah, uh, we just killed that. And It's that, a really it fun just, fight, I feel like, for it, monk healers. Because... It, yeah, a lot of mobility. It's really nice. A lot of personal responsibility, which uh, <laughs> is half of our wipes, probably. Um, but yeah, I mean, boss like that, it, I think they're fun and yeah. Was there a moment um, when you were playing WoW when you realized like I'm trying I'm trying to figure out so there's there's like three different ways that people come into elite esport and I'm by elite mm -hmm. e esport I usually mean that there's a global competitive ladder and mm -hmm. you're at the top like you know one or or two percent of it. Okay. Um, and just for perspective, for example, uh, if you look at all the basketball players in the world. And you look at the pros, uh, the top point, uh, point zero two percent or point two percent, depending on if you look at international leagues of basketball players are like getting paid to play the professional. Okay. Yeah. Um, and so when you look at uh, esport ladders and you look at the you know the distribution of players all the way out to the tail end, um, for example, in League of Legends, you have to be better than a NBA basketball player at your <laughs> sport to to compete. You have to be point zero 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 two percent. Uh, in the top to be paid to play but but on the ladder like we can represent the like you know the the people who would be in the nba if this were if we had mm -hmm. that many jobs um and i think like based on your ladder ranking you're definitely in where that nba player category would be so yeah. there's like a couple different trajectories people take to realize that they get there there's there's people who who like they're like okay I've grown up my whole life wanting to do this, you know, and, and they're like sitting there, you know, with a book and they're like training really hard and they're bad and they get good. And then there's people who just kind of like accidentally end up there because of the way that they're, they were raised or like the way that they approach games. Um, and, and they just wake up one day and they're like, wow, okay, I guess I'm pretty good at this. I should start refining myself. Mm -hmm. um, so for you, was it like a decision where you decided to apply yourself or did you, when was the moment when you realized that you're really good at, at World of Warcraft? Like, like as in, you play the same amount of hours as somebody else, but yeah. they're 1500 ranking and you're a 2400 ranking. You know? Right, right. I try to stay humble. I'm decent. <laughs> I'm decent. Um, so I, I'm not like other PVPers mostly. I haven't been PVPing since vanilla. I actually raided from vanilla up until halfway through Legion. Uh, maybe, actually, maybe the end of WAD. I just PVE'd. So I started PVPing end of WAD and then I started PVPing full time in legion and i'm definitely the first one i was really bad like no tr like truly you know 1200 i clicked all my raid frames all my abilities i keyboard turned and then i think like halfway through legion wait so you keyboard turned all the way up to legion yeah when i raided and everything yeah no it was bad i had to watch the swifty video of how to not keyboard turn like 30 times. But this is, I, this I, should be inspiring for all the people who want to get it, gladiator. I'm actually. not even kidding. That's this is, it's why I help people because I'm, I'm telling you, I used to be really, really, really bad. And then halfway through Legion, I was watching, I was watching Sidu play Miss Weaver. And it's, it's kind of like when I was playing Hearthstone, I was like, man, like Sidu is killing it. And he's like new to Miss Weaver. If, if he can do it, why can't, like, why can't I do it? So I just started taking the games just a little bit more seriously. Um, I found a consistent team, which I think is really important for Arena. Um, probably all parts of WoW and any video game, actually anything, is just finding a consistent team and just tried every single loss. I just never blamed anyone else except for myself. Um, 
because even if my teammates made mistakes, I, I'm sure there's a mistake I made. So um, always blame myself for losses and just try to improve on that. And that's that's pretty much it. I just did that for a few expansions now. And yeah, that, that's pretty much it. So I heard, I heard two really important things. One is that um, when you said you started taking games a lot more seriously, I think mm-hmm. that there is a there's a process through which the brain recognizes mistakes and then tries mm-hmm. to improve the decision making process. Okay. Um, and it very much involves like like a lot of different areas of the brain, but but one area in particular called the uh, ACC, the anterior cingulate cortex, which f- essentially like fires up in activity like really high after the after we know that somebody has recognized that they made a mistake. Okay. For a couple seconds, and and the mm. the the theory, the hypothesis, is that it, it helps to stimulate the neurotransmitters that that are responsible for like promoting, uh, like changes in your neurons, uh, okay. meaning like changing channels, you know, growing, growing new connections, yeah. um, not neurogenesis like creating new neurons, but rather redirecting current ones, um, and so we know that like this is a chemical process and a biological process, but it's also mm-hmm. like a psychological process because we know that this area of the brain can be um, like suppressed by high anxiety. So if you, for example, are on stage in front of 30,000 people and you're not used to it mm-hmm. and you make a big mistake, um, this part of the brain can just completely malfunction and not at all allow you to learn anything because you're so stressed out. Uh, yeah. And probably vice versa. If you just write it off and you're like, this mistake isn't really important and I don't really care about it. And I don't really care about improving. Uh, and I'm better than these people because I can't be losing to them. I just want to feel superior and I don't want my identity to be hurt. You know, you're not taking it seriously for lots of reasons that people don't take things seriously because they don't want to be hurt, you know, emotionally. Then probably this area of the brain also, I, I haven't read any research about it in this direction, but I'm pretty sure that it, it's pretty founded in the theory. So I would imagine that that's a really important part of it is just taking it more seriously in the first yeah. place. Um, yeah, Sorry. When you no no you get when you when you're just queuing with friends and not really taking serious like mistakes and you lose you just queue it back up and not even think about it really you know you just all right we lost queue it up again not even talk about it don't acknowledge it and, but yeah once you start taking it a bit seriously especially when you stream and you have people watching you it's I actually feel get embarrassed like my face will get bright, bright red and I, I will feel embarrassment when I make a pretty obvious mistake because. Not every game, but I'll make mistakes here and there in games, and it's not really that noticeable. But if I trinket something bad or I don't use a cooldown when I should have, I, I actually get embarrassed because people are watching. And Do you get embarrassed and, when you're not on stream at that? Or are you just like in the zone? Uh, when I'm not on stream, I, I honestly tend to make less mistakes than when I'm on stream. And I, I don't actually know why. I think it's because I don't, I really don't. I tend to make less mistakes. If I make a mistake, I'm, I don't get that embarrassed. Well, no. what about when you first started queuing? Like, if you go back all mm. the way to when, like, for the very first time you were going against Ooh. other people, did you have some of that, like, performance anxiety when you stepped into your first PvP matches that kind of, like, went away as you got used to it? No, I get that still now. Oh, really? Yeah, I st- Every time you queue yeah, up. Yeah, when I first started playing, though, which was when I really just started queuing in the arena was Mop. Uh, the first half when I played, uh, I actually wouldn't queue. Even when I had was in a group with people, I was so nervous and I, I was worried because the I lose rating, but so does the person I'm teamed up with. And I didn't want to be the reason, if I make a mistake, I don't want to be the reason why they lose rating. Mm-hmm. Um, and then also people kind of raged and I didn't like getting yelled at for a mistake I made as well. So, And then, yeah, today... It, it goes away the farther into arena, like the more games I queue, it goes away. But the first few games when I'm first queuing, I'm actually really nervous. I think it's imposter syndrome because I don't know. No matter what rating I'm at, if I lose, well, of course I lost. Uh, so I don't even deserve to be here. So, yeah. I mean, yeah, there's the psychological component for sure, I feel like. Yeah. And and you can you can fight that with self-talk probably. Yeah. I think that everybody has that mm-hmm. like self-doubt. Um, yeah. some some to a clinical level you know <laughs> and some to just like a normal human level but yeah there's there's a definite um there's this book called uh 
uh, Top Dog, The Science of Winning and Losing. Uh, it's mm-hmm. written, it's one of the books I actually like, actually recommend. I don't read a lot of books because I mostly read research, but this book was written by two scientists and they're highlighting yeah. different research in every chapter and it's all very well cited. But in this one chapter, they go over this field of research on cortisol. Cortisol is like mm-hmm. the stress hormone, the one that like shows okay. up when you are stressed out. Yeah. That is responsible for a lot of things like the tightening up of your chest and like the sweaty mm-hmm. hands and whatever. Um, and they tell this really great story of the under, of the realization that there is a difference in between performance and um, just like stressful encounters. So they mm-hmm. have, there's these studies that were done in the 80s on, on cortisol production and they took people who were like not used to falling from the sky and they threw them out of airplanes um, with <laughs> parachutes, <Lord>. obviously. <laughs> and they measured their cortisol when they got to the ground. Yeah. And um, the first flight obviously their cortisol levels were pretty dang high but Mm -hmm. by the third time that they were thrown out of an airplane and they tested this like both throwing people out three times the same day or like uh you know one time and then waiting a couple weeks and then doing it again you know or like different kinds of times in between yeah Uh, by about the third or fourth time the cortisol levels that they would have in their body were the same as what you would expect to see in a person who's stuck in traffic in la so just My driving God. around in like the normal kind of like, ah, kind of yeah. like road rage level cortisol, <laughs> yeah. right? Um, and then they co- if, you, if you're looking at the story of cortisol, and we fast forward to studies that are done on uh, the, the example that they use, uh, and there are other ones now because this is like widely replicated research, but the stories that they use are the ones done on ballroom dancers in the UK. So they went to these ballroom dance competitions, which were community competitions, right? So they're like, Mm -hmm. there might be like a professional there all the way down to like amateurs. uh, And they're they're going out and they're competing in front of judges and then all the rest of the audience too. And usually there's like five or six couples on the floor at the same time. And sometimes there's just one depending on the, like what you're competing with. And they would be competing in ballroom dance essentially. Not like, it's like a graded judged event, Okay, But... And in some ways, you're kind of like trying to beat yourself, but other also there's mm-hmm. like an actual winner and loser, kind of like figure skating. Yeah. Um, and to a T, every single person who stepped out on the stage, whether they were like a 20 years veteran or whether this was their like very first competition that they've ever done, mm-hmm. um, they would have higher levels of cortisol in their body than the people who were being thrown out of the airplane for the first time. My God. You never wow. get used to it is the yeah. takeaway. They're saying like when you're in performance oh. and when you are being judged and you know you're being judged, there is this element of uh, like adrenaline production and performance mm. inducing biochemistry that your body just does naturally. It's just like we are competing now. Like this is yeah. uh, like it's on the wire. Like and I know it's on the wire. And and there's there's ways of coping with this. Like the people who'd been 20 years experienced, it's not like they had less cortisol. It's like they just dealt with the the heightened pressure like better because they were oh, so okay. used to dealing with it so yeah. you were saying like the first few games you play are like really ha, ha, and then it yeah. like comes down it, probably it doesn't even come down that much like maybe it does a little bit um yeah. but like also it's just like you kind of like get the self-talk in dialed in you know where you make a few mistakes mm-hmm. and you tell yourself see it's not that bad or like these things the, the psychological edge is taken off and then yeah. all that remains is the biochemistry of of like adrenaline you know, kind of kicking in. That's kind of crazy. You mentioned that, that story. Cause like not to bring it more towards like wrestling, but there's two different tournaments for wrestling. There's dual tournaments and then there's individual tournaments and the dual tournaments are just, it's one a day. You only have one wrestling match a day and and that's it. And I would wrestle. I mean, I'd still kind of win, but I would wrestle poorly because it was only one match and I would still get nervous. Like I, I would always get nervous I, I would get stomach aches. My hands would be sweaty. I'd be so nervous for every match. Like even if I've beaten this kid five times over, it won't, I would still get nervous. And then in the individual tournaments, I'd still wrestle poorly the first match. But then as the day went on, I would get better. And I would just thought, oh, okay, I'm just warming up. But it actually makes way more sense because I would also get less nervous and handle it a little bit better. So it's kind of crazy to think about. I thought it was just me. No, it's every human. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> Um, there, there is a, there's a famous case of the, I don't know if you guys saw you guys, I say, cause I'm <laughs> recording this. I'm not streaming. I'm used to streaming and I'm staring at OBS. So I'm like, we must be live. But like, I don't know if you have seen the, um, the stratosphere jump from Felix, um, the Red Bull stratosphere jump. I don't remember I his did. last name. His name is Felix, yeah. but I don't remember his last name. Yeah. 
Yeah, so he like yeah jumped out in his spacesuit from outer space. Right. Um, oh yeah. So when he was prepping for that jump, remember this is like a big team, right? There's like over thirty people working on this project and yeah. over a million dollars invested in it. Um, and they got the pressurized suit because he needs to wear it to not essentially have medical problems mm-hmm. when he does this jump. Yeah. Um, so he's wearing this pressurized spacesuit, which is designed, of course, for like movability and visibility, but not for a normal human if you're used to walking around in clothing. It's like incredibly yeah. stiff. Like you have to exert massive amounts of muscular force to like move the joints. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, because it's used to like being used in space where there's like no air pressure, you know, yeah. uh, that's how they designed it. But he, he got claustrophobia. He like started having wow. panic attacks. So he has to sit in this in this suit, in this balloon for like hours upon hours upon hours while he's floating all the way up to the edge of space. And he would he wasn't even making it like 30 minutes before he's having a full-blown claustrophobia panic attacks. Um, and they were like, what do we do? Like halt the project. Like yeah. we, we only have a few weeks till we're, you know, going up. So like, what are we going to do? So they called in um, this sports psychology trainer, Michael Gervais. Actually, I think he's a full-blown sports psychologist, Michael Gervais. And he um, he basically just like desensitized him. He's like, okay, we're going to self-talk our way through this and we're going to bring you to the edge, absolute edge of panic, just like the point where you're just like about to lose it and we're just going to deal with it. And so he did that over wow. and over and over again for like like 30 hours of, <sighs> of this grueling training straight where they were just like, okay, how long can you sit? Okay, we're going to sit there until you're starting to panic. Okay, when you're starting to panic, like call me and we'll talk through it. And it desensitized him all the way to being able to do it the whole length. You know, wow, that's incredible. So, so there is like this. Not, I wouldn't say like warming up, although that's a really good way to think about it in terms of the brain, where you're just like, okay, I'm I'm getting used to this kind of pressure again. Yeah. Okay, I'm remembering what I say to myself, you know, uh, and yeah, and 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 then and then you you start to like deal with the pressure and the cortisol just better uh, yeah. as it goes. I wonder if there's a way to preload that. Like, I bet that we could work out some way of making sure that like the first match was keyed in because that's that's definitely something that you have to deal with in performance prep for i i play with the warrior who'd also kind <clears> of <throat> he would call it a warm-up game but I've, he would get a little bit nervous b- uh, beforehand and he would cue one or two skirmishes we would cue with our main team before we started actually like queuing on ladder we would cue two or three skirmishes just just to uh kind of deal with it you know obviously in skirmishes we're we're gonna win like we're fully geared. These are scrims. These are people. So they're easy wins, and it just gets out of the way, kind of warm up, kind of ease into it. So, yeah, that's kind of how he dealt with it, which makes sense to do. Yeah. I think, like, when, when we have the League of Legends team, we have the same problem. On a, on a, on a scrimmage day, we'll play eight to ten games, five five mm-hmm. games, like, as a team, and then they'll go and they'll play, you know, maybe two or three games as a team, or just like, you know, five to 15 games by themselves on the, on the ladder. Okay. And, um, but then they go to the, the, the match game on Friday and Saturday. And it's like, you sit there for hours mm-hmm. before the match. And then it's like the wrestling, the one, the one match per day yeah. wrestling thing, right? Where you're like, you're yeah. just sitting there and you're just thinking and thinking and thinking about this that's, one you're game that's thinking, coming. Yep, and yep. all of your mental weight is saying, this game is the most important thing that's going to happen today. Yeah. It's the most important. Yep. And your brain's like, you can't fool your brain. If you're, yeah. if you're doing a scrimmage on Friday and you're like, you're losing and you're like, yeah, but I'm going to queue up for another scrimmage. Like, as soon as this is over, yeah. you know, we're going to have a five minute yeah. break and we're going to do it again. Your brain's like, okay, so this isn't really that important. So like I can yeah. make a mistake here. Who cares? But then like when you're sitting there for hours anticipating this one moment, you keep yep. yourself up uh, yeah. really high. And then, and then they would have to go play and somehow like, you know, manage to make it through the game. And then afterwards, like if you, if you, for example, had these like wrestling tournaments and you played, mm-hmm you did like five or six games in a row, you might be yeah. able to play off that first game. You might be able to like get a few, right. like a few seconds in and be like, it's okay. Yeah. Like, uh, you know, I'll have another chance to redeem myself. So like, yeah. it's chill. You know, I'll just like, I'll, I'll wrestle. But like, if you know that you're just going to like be done and be done done, then mm-hmm. again, that like oh. comes into your brain and it, and it says like, okay, this, the pressure's on, you know, performance right. is on the line. So you, you have this one shot. We would do, do all sorts of things to prepare the team for this. I think one of the mm. things we did, of course, was we did warm up games in the morning mm-hmm. before we got on the bus. 
But I guess you're advantaged in that you can play them directly before your scrimmage. I wonder how the AWC teams go. Like, I bet that they're able to just play warm-ups it, right before the AWC. Yeah, I've queued a few scrims with them before games, and then there was actually one time that they were just queuing ladder before their AWC team, their AWC game, and they left mid-game because they, they were up. So, oh, wow. So they're yeah. just trying to stay fresh and loose. Yeah, yeah. And and not take it important. Because there's, there's also the opposite, which is like, if you lower the importance of it too much, then you actually aren't as focused as you need to be sometimes. Mm. Yeah. Um, there's like a balance in the middle where if, if you're just like, oh, it's just like any other practice or any other scrim, mm-hmm. uh, then you can be too relaxed and too chill and too not yeah. keyed up. That doesn't sound like your problem, though. You, it sounds like you no. have the opposite problem. Yeah. Well, for wrestling, I had a coach, you know, per, uh, practice makes perfect, but that wasn't good enough for him. He said perfect practice makes perfect because if you make the same mistake 100 times, you're going to, you're just going to make that mistake. So yeah, that's, that's kind of where I come from where making a mistake probably it, it's just bad. Yeah. Make a mistake. Right. Isn't good. I mean, he's right. Uh, yeah. Oh, no, no. Hallmarks. One of the hallmarks of practice is that yeah. it, practice makes permanent. Yeah. So whatever you practice is what you end up doing. Mm-hmm. Um, so I feel like we, uh, we didn't present any good solutions for people who are sitting at like 1200 rating really want to get into PVP. And yeah. I feel like this is actually hurting participation of PVP and wow, is they're mm-hmm. sitting there staring at it and they're like, I'm going to cause the rating loss of this person who I'm with. These matches last yeah. 30 seconds. I make a bunch of mistakes because I don't know anything mm-hmm. and then we lose and then they're mad at me and they scream and then I just don't even want to do it anymore. And then they go off and they yeah. run a dungeon because <laughs> the like the yeah. bosses don't yell at you or they don't come right? at you like differently right they're just like yeah. it's very predictable so is it a yeah. problem of just like the people in wow aren't in wow to to have this kind of ladder setting with pressure and so like obviously participation is low or is there some design that we can do that would like improve it for the population that would that would yeah. take care of this ladder anxiety for ladder anxiety in general um find a team and then almost treat it like PVE and just focus on your character and try to learn your character. That's what I did. Um, I learned my healing rotation and just try to perfect it. I didn't worry about CC and obviously I was still low rated, but I focused on just healing, keep my team alive Uh, as far as a healer. Like that's all I did. I just keep my team alive. That's my goal. And then you get to the point where, you know, Okay, you can you can keep your team alive a little bit easier now. You're starting to understand. And then all right, let me try to stun. Let me let me try to stun a kill target. Let me try to CC a healer. And you just keep building off of that until you get to the point where you're you have to do a lot at the same time. Um keeping your team alive, CC the healer, react to offensive cooldowns, and then just keep doing that over and over until and then at the same time you kinda want to queue with the same team. Because when you're queuing arena you need to trust your teammates. Um, I don't know how other teams do it, but for when I queue, I feel like the healer is the quarterback of the team, uh, calling out cooldowns, um, calling out defensives, calling out other teams' cooldowns. Um, so maybe that's just pressure I put on myself because I do see other teams. Some of the DPS can tend to do that, but the healers have um, have a different point of view of the game where we see everything. You know, we're we're in the back, we're seeing where everyone is, we're seeing. Right seeing what's going on and so i think probably, healers are kind probably of... there's like a damage prediction component to that because like i bet that you are in the middle of a match and you're like you can tell like 10 seconds in the future that somebody's already dead you're like shoot my right. teammate's dead like <laughs> yeah and you'll you know hear it already lot. right yeah yeah it, so, so like that's something someone, like a dps yeah. player wouldn't necessarily know i think right like i don't know a good example is rogue mage really punishing if you don't have trinkets or cooldowns so if i don't have trinket i'm calling out to my teammates you know mage combustion in 10 seconds i need you guys to use your cooldowns i don't have any so stuff like that i think the healer it's a lot of pressure i feel on the healer uh, because there is a lot of damage but um you kind of just practice and that's why you need to keep with the same team because when I, when you get to the point where you tell your team you're fine I, I like trust me you're fine you don't need to use anything right now i got you and your team doesn't use anything and you got them i you, there is trust uh with your teammates that you kind of need to establish i feel 
And 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 then you play with the same team because then when you violate that trust and you don't got them, you guys just laugh it off and like exactly it's yeah. their job to say like haha no worries like go next yeah. like yeah. screw mages, yeah I'll say like whatever. oh that's that's my bad yeah yeah and they'll just be like mages op don't worry about it man or, or uh, like well every game I mean every you play game in this I say that, yeah. so what can we expect yeah. haha yep yeah, exactly that that it really is true though it's it, it, but it's it's a cop out I feel like when I'm pugging on like my alt misweaver. And people are like, oh, we lost because we play Miss Weaver. But meanwhile, they didn't shrink it when they should have. Or yeah, like well, it's when it's with a team, a good excuse. When it's with a team, it's like a jovial way of like helping them feel better. Right. You know, oh, yeah. Because they know you don't yeah. mean it and you're saying it yeah. to like as a joke. It, you know? it is bad though because the, I was at a point, I think halfway through season one of Shadowlands, where Miss Weavers were really, really bad. I mean, we're still really bad, but we were really bad. And I was just blaming every loss. Oh, you know, I play Miss Weaver. You know, I play Miss Weaver. Mm-hmm. You know, of course we're gonna lose that, but that's not good. I felt like that, like blaming it because I play Miss Weaver isn't a good reason. I'm sure I made mistakes. I didn't play the game perfect, so I well, think this, focusing this on goes mistakes. goes back to the kind of the second thing that you said a long time ago about how it is that you got better was that you always tried to look for what it is you could improve. I think. Right. How yeah. Did you put it. You said like I I blamed myself for every loss. Yeah, every single basic, one. Yeah, that's Still not do. necessarily good. But the basic no, idea is no. that you're always like, there was something in this game I could learn from, and and that's yeah. definitely something that I've noticed as a difference between, um, like elite players and pro players. I've I've mm-hmm. coached a lot of players, and I've been fortunate enough to coach on a lot of teams where they have been like, like goats. You know, like greatest of all. Oh time, yeah, yeah, I'm like sure. Players yeah. and they and they were like to a to a T. They they always tried to figure out what they could have done to make yeah. the situation better, even Absolutely. if they were like all the way across the map, mm-hmm. you know? And, and yeah. then I have encountered yeah. other people on other teams who I tell them what they could do to help mm-hmm. win the game because their teammate is dropping the ball and they're like, yeah, but that's his job. And I say, yeah, I but do you want to like win or not? And they said, well, yeah, I guess I, we'll just lose until we trade him. Oh, you know, I, I couldn't play with people like that. Yeah, and um, so yeah, it, yeah. There's this aspect of like perfectionism where you have to say, "What could I do in every point?" To, and sometimes it's nothing you you do yourself oh, with your own character. It's something hundred like, percent. How could I like train this person to notice this thing? What should I have said earlier? You yeah, know, like, like I, I think last night we were queuing. I was queuing Thunder, and we were losing to Red Warrior, who's they're the best comp in the game. I'm, like they're the, they're playing the best comp in the game. And we lost to them. And I don't think I made a mistake, but I still tried to, man, like, is there something I could have done better? And then I thought, man, you know, if I'm in this position, why did I get to this position? And then I realized maybe I, maybe I overextend too much. Maybe I pour it kind of poorly. So I don't know. I never found it. I never, ever found it useful to blame somebody else uh, for a loss. I, I, I don't think it's useful, like, at all. Because then you're just... You're trying to put the whole game, an entire game of blame on one person when, I mean, no one really plays perfect 100% of the time. So I've never found it useful. And, and it limits your, your personal growth in like optimizing yeah. your skills. Like you could always yeah. port a little bit better or like have a better angle right. on the pillar or like take like, you know, 50 less damage. And, and it might not yeah. matter for the win or loss, but like if the other team is going to make an error... Yeah, and you're not able to capitalize on it because you're not playing so perfectly. Like, right? Then, yeah, that's so important. Yeah, no, hundred percent. Yeah. So one thing that occurred to me was you mentioned that you started playing Miss Weaver after you saw what, what was his name? Seon. Sidu. 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 That's right. Yeah. After the after I started the, taking um, Miss Weaver seriously. What's, yeah. What's that thing? The water jet. You know the thing you you ride on. It's like a motorcycle on the water. Shoots out. No, you know the sea do, s e a d o. Oh, like the elemental. No, 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 no. Like in the real world. No, like, like actually on the bay, you know, down in no. in, in in Florida. In oh, yes, skis, yes, skis, yes, yes. Okay. Oh my lord. Sorry. Yeah. Sea do as in like like after the jet ski, like it's a sea do, like or was that oh how he spelled God. his name? No, S-E-A-D-O-O. I think his first name is Chuck, so it's C, and then his last name is Doolin. Oh, okay. So see do. Yeah. All right. All right. So not the jet ski. <laughs> Got it. All right. So uh, random sidetrack there. <laughs> Good. Are there jet skis in WoW? You I, never know when you're talking about an RPG. So. Yeah, right? Where, yeah. where to do, drive the line between like real world and, and yeah. fake world. But um, okay. So 
that's a long time to be playing a single class. I have noticed that one of the defects in, or one of the, the coping mechanisms of World of Warcraft players is uh, when they hit a limit of their skill that is judged, that is judging them and makes them feel like bad and that they it's like a wall they have to push through to learn something. There's some people who will just go play an alternate character and get to that mm-hmm. same level on that character rather than trying to like push through the the growth that they need yeah. on their on their like main character let's say in order to like mm. improve and so because it's, it's uncomfortable it's uncomfortable to be bad at something and to get yelled oh, at yeah. and to like yeah. work with the team and fail them uh, yeah. and so they just like will go off to an alt and they'll they'll bring that level up that alt up to the same level and then they'll stop there at the moment of discomfort kind of like and not get yeah. better so what is your perspective about how you playing like literally the same class for i don't know since legion <laughs> Has like yeah. Now I know I know that you have to play a bunch of different classes to get knowledge. Like you probably have hunter alts right. and like whatever you know, just yeah. PvP. But do you think that this is one of the things that has allowed you to like actually improve? Is that you like focus down on a single character? And I think having alts is really good and playing different classes because you can have a somewhat decent understanding of how a spec works, but until you play it, you I don't think you really understand it. So. What's a good example? Like, um, like Beastmaster Hunters, for example. Uh, a lot of people uh, would ask me, you know, why why do I play Disarm versus Beastmaster Hunters? All their damage is pets. Uh, but I actually have a Beastmaster Hunter alt. I do not take it serious. The item level is like 190. It not at all. But uh, what I re- what I noticed is Beastmaster Hunters can't use kill shot, and they can't use Cobra shot while disarmed, and they also can't kick while disarmed. So. If I get kicked or something and I disarm the hunter, it stops a lot of their damage. So, and I feel like something like that you don't really realize unless you actually play it or understand it. Um, but as far as playing one class, it's also fun. Like, actually, I, I really enjoy Miss Weaver. Um, but I think the best way to improve is, is getting really, really good at one spec and just play as high level as you can and just keep trying to learn from there. So, you would promote the idea of playing one spec but you must get some nuance from like playing other character or maybe like, could you watch other people's streams or watch? Yeah. Yeah. That too. Yeah. That's another good way. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Like I watch peekaboo for rogue stuff and how to counter them. And did you ever face this like psychological choice where you had to be like, okay, well I could stay on my misweaver and like suck a little bit and like push through this, like, level or i could go on an alt and just like crush a bunch of noobs and feel good about myself you know all the way up to the same rating uh 100 um like what 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 do you do when you're faced with that choice like what why do you think that you are the kind of person who stays logged on to your character and keeps <sighs> pushing it uh honestly to prove people wrong that miss are bad I, that's one of the reasons i people say miss is bad i like winning when i shouldn't i guess um and then I, I again, I'm just really competitive, so I, I used to be really bad, like terrible, and I was going into Legion. I was maybe an 1800 Mistweaver, maybe 2K, and it, it was uncomfortable because I had to accept that I was bad. You know, up until that point, I was like, "Oh, 2K is so good," and then I watched people getting like 3K rated. I'm just, I guess I'm not that good. So then I just kept playing it and just kept trying to improve. That's pretty much it. I heard I heard two things that are really important. Um, that are kind of like generalizable. One of them is is to have these mini games. I think you mentioned it at another point um, when you were saying like focus on just keeping people alive, and mm-hmm. then focus on like stunning the kill target, and then focus yeah. on CCing, like, uh, and then yeah. focus on defensives. You know, um, mm-hmm. so like this idea of like going in, expecting to lose, expecting to fail, accepting that you're bad. Like mm-hmm. muting, muting your teammates on the, let's say you're queuing with randoms, right? Like muting yeah. your teammates instantly and not listening to any of their rage because yeah. you don't care because yeah. you know that you're just like improving and you yeah. just focus on your mini game, which is like keep mm-hmm. my teammates alive, yep. you know, until you're good at it and then building yeah. on that pyramid. Like, I feel right. like that's a really good way to like protect yourself in this like psychological box and allow you to actually push play on the like yeah. queue. Yeah. Whereas you might not if you're going in trying to like pull off everything and, yeah. and, and impress people. Yeah, because I've never, I've never, again, I've never played League, but 
as far as WoW goes, it is really overwhelming, especially for a new player to learn everything about how to get good in PvP. So I think just having like little stepping stones, one thing at a time, building blocks, just one one thing at a time. You don't need to learn everything at once. Um, one just one small piece at a time. That's what I did. You know, again, I keyboard turned and I clicked all my abilities until like Legion. So I started off with watching Swifty's videos on how to not keyboard turn. And then I started making keybinds, and then from there just kept building it up. Wow. Yeah. And and the second thing you mentioned was like having this vendetta or this agenda. I feel like <laughs> this goes back to your core motivation. I've I I I think that the best players that I have worked with all have something that they can sum up in a sentence that like explains the thing that they're doing. Like mm-hmm. I want to be the best. Or like, I yeah. must beat this person. Or mm. I have to prove my brother wrong that like <laughs> yeah. not going that him going to med school and me going into video games is the right choice. Yeah. You know? Yeah, like right. they have their like yeah. they're like, this is like I will not fail because yeah. it will admit defeat at this like they they have this point of drive, right? And you it yeah. sounds like you had this like a drive or this agenda. And this is yeah. a double edged sword, right? It's like the perfectionism oh. you mentioned where you like it's my personality and I love it and I hate it. You know, oh, it, it forces I, you to do one thing like too hard. Yeah, I I actually get really depressed um, if we queue and we lose a lot. I, I I actually it really it actually does affect my mood because it's not that we it's not that losing depresses me. It's like I like I I'm just so competitive. I don't like losing, and you won't like I'm chill. Like I'm pretty relaxed. Like I'm not gonna rage or anything. But in, internally, I'm. I'm not raging, but I'm more, I'm I'm like depressed. It really, it really does affect my mood after. I'm just like, man, like, I don't know. I, why do I even play this game? To, to some points, I really, some points, it's just like, why do I even play? Why do I upload videos when I just lost like seven games in a row? I, I yeah. And then on the opposite of that, you have that like high of, you know, we just won like 12 games in a row. I'm the greatest. Um, But yeah, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it, I like it, but I well, love it at the same time. It's like this, like I said, this double-edged sword of you you actually cannot become the best in the world at something unless you integrate mm-hmm. it into your identity. Like you can't, Simone yeah. Biles can't go out and be like, I'm doing gymnastics for a hobby. Yeah, you know, right, wee, yeah, wee. yeah. Like it has yeah. to like be her. You yeah. Know? It has to mean she has to be gymnastics, gymnastics has to be her. And the same is yeah. true for like weightlifting and swimming. And mm-hmm. if you want to be the best in the world at a particular craft, you have to embody that craft, but then the the downside is that it becomes who you are, and then right. when the, like you suck at it, or like you get the visible data that like mm-hmm. says to you from the world that like you're bad at this, you're bad at this. Then yeah. it's like yeah. you're bad, not you're bad at this, but rather like you are. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So no, it's, exactly. It's, it's like it's a test of endurance. I feel like in some ways, mm-hmm. like how much people can lose and still just roll roll out of bed the next day and like have a buoyant attitude about it versus like there's there's plenty of examples of this in swimming which is kind of like my main sport i was a swimming coach before i came into esports but nice there's this australian swimmer named ian thorpe and he Mm -hmm. got to the best in the world but couldn't maintain it and struggled with that identity right and just like fell off into coping mechanisms and coaching and just all of these ways of struggling to conform with the fact that the world was telling him like well now you're third place and he's like but i can't be because that would mean that i'm not first place you know Mm -hmm. he couldn't accept that or rather he couldn't get out of bed the next season and then like train with the intention to get back up on the top whereas like other swimmers like michael phelps like he fell off in london you know and went through this crisis and then decided that that he was going to, that, that essentially that like this was his identity, but like um, he was okay with being like second place, you know, right, or third yeah, place or eighth yeah. place, but because because he pursued it for the sake of pursuing it, you know, uh, yeah. and knew that he was doing the best that he could and went to Rio, you know, like just really ready to like um, accept the results, like radically accept the results of what he did just on the basis of like the fact that he did it and kind of like be satisfied with that while still yeah. trying to pursue excellence, you know? So I think it's like this, it's like this fine line that can make or break people uh, when they're trying to pursue something at the level you're trying to pursue it. And, and you have to, you just have to accept it as part of you. 
and then you get yeah, to the that, state where you know losses really hurt. Yeah, I mean, it does help me. You know, if I do my best, what what more can I do? So that that's what helps me. Kind of, it doesn't last a long time, but yeah, if if I do my best, that that that's all I can do. Do you have dogs? How can you tell? Or is that a neighbor's dog? <laughs> no, that is my puppy. And I'm sorry, I also have an iguana. Do you do, you do right? dog therapy also? No, no. I was wondering if you just like go and pet your dog and play no, fetch you, with them. And like, I feel like animals no, play right. a huge part into oh, yeah. people cope with stress. So Yeah. Just broke my mic. Can you still hear me? Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, all right. So let's go back to this question and see if we can pick it apart the way that we yeah. solved these other problems for we've solved them completely you're never going to have a struggle with them again and everybody who's listening <laughs> now knows exactly like how to yeah obviously no you know the answer uh, a lot of people play pvp as much as you um but they never get any better so like how why are you able to learn and i, I know it's like you say it's knowledge based and you know all these things but like some people study it and they go in the game and they just can't integrate it so um how much of what you do is autodidactic, meaning that you just learn automatically? Like you go into the game and you have, you just have some goals in mind and you just kind of like keep remember them and then you just kind of do them. And how much of it is very systematized and that you, you literally write down or you have a to-do list, even if it's mental, and you go in and you like simplify the game to the point where you're just doing that like one thing in order to remember it. Um, or you have reminders or like how much like if you have a system how much of your learning is a system and how much of it is just automatic if you're concentrating on something it just happens you know yeah like for for arena it's a bunch of systems in one game so there's some points of the game where you're gonna just want to you just want to hit heal so if a red pallet uses wings you just want to get in a healing mode and just to keep everyone alive and then there's other points in the game where you want to push in for crowd control while also keeping your team alive. So there is a difference, but I, I it's kind of hard to say. I, sorry, when, can I just check my dog real quick? And I'm just, yeah. Yeah, sorry. I can't concentrate. Sorry. <laughs> Let me pause. Okay. Yeah, so is he, is he okay, by the way? Yeah, yeah. He? Just a puppy and wants food. Oh, cute. Give us some food. Yeah. We're, so if you uh, we're going to get our first animals uh, for the family starting in January. Oh, what are you getting? We're going to get two cats and a dog. Oh, wow. Have so you decided kids, like what kind of dog? Our kids are like um, three, five, seven, and nine. And so oh, we wow. figure like they're ready, basically. Yeah. And, yeah. Um, we're going to get whatever dog survives where we are. We're just going to go, <laughs> we're going to like find out who has dogs in the neighborhood and we're going to get like a mutt. Because we live in, we're moving back to Finland, so oh wow, okay. it's like four to six hours from the Arctic Circle. So it's wow. There's not a lot of dogs yeah. that like just run outside. Right? It's thirty below yeah. and a meter of snow, <laughs> yeah. and they're like totally happy, you know. So it's yeah, like, you kind of oh got to get the dog for the environment. So yeah. they have these dogs called the Belgian Malinois, which is like um, it's basically oh, a big one, German Shepherd, but it's like a Belgian yeah. Shepherd. It kind of looks yeah. like your, your average police dog, right? Yeah, but it's, yeah. It's not as it's a lot furrier. Oh, that's awesome. Um they have like a Finnish oh, version called the Finnish Shepherd, which basically yeah. looks like the German Shepherd, but it's like even furrier, you know. Yeah. Oh my god. Um oh, that sounds awesome. And then I don't know, there's other people that said we should get like one of those Japanese dogs, the big fluffy ones, you know, that like live in the snow yeah. in the or whatever. And there's other people yeah, that said yeah. we should get a Saint Bernard, like the big oh, those, oh Swiss mountain dogs. Yeah. <laughs> but I don't know. What kind of dog do you have? We have a golden. Golden Retriever. Oh. Yeah. He's like five months. So, yeah. And yeah, a cat. Had, I had Labradors and a Retriever yeah. and a mix growing up. And um, mm-hmm. I don't know. Retrievers, I feel like, are smarter than Labs. So maybe they would be fine. But our Labs were so dumb that they would go out <laughs> and like hurt themselves in the cold, you know? Yeah. I had Boxers growing up. Same exact thing. <laughs> yeah. I, oh, my Lord. <laughs> Okay, so yeah, we get well. We know that we need to get a smart dog so that it doesn't kill yeah. itself by like, yeah. running into a frozen river and then being yeah. like, "Why is it so cold? What's going yeah. on?" Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay. Um, all right. So back yeah. on topic. the The basic yeah. question was, how do you learn as a learner in sport? You obviously learn automatically when you play. There's some part of that that is just true, and mm. that probably comes from how you were raised. 
uh, maybe yeah. genetic a little bit, but from what we know from research, like it has a lot to do with how you were raised from the age of 11 months to four years old. Okay. Um, determines like how much of your learning is auto automatic. Mm -hmm. um, but like, do you also like make to-do lists before you go into games or have like notes pasted on your screen or do you review your VODs or like, how is it that yeah. you, you improved in rank? What did you need to do in order to force yourself to learn from situations where you just weren't getting better no matter how much you played? Yeah. The first thing is record your gameplay. That is even to this day, every single video, I'm actually disappointed when I see mistakes that I make when I'm watching my gameplay back. You'd be surprised how many times you would catch what mistake uh, mistakes you're making that you don't even realize you're doing um, just by looking at your VOD. So I would say that. And then going into an arena, or arena specifically, is it's it's really trading cooldowns. That's that's what you're trying to do. So you're trying to, it's like a puzzle, at least that's how I think of it, where you're trying to figure out the best cooldowns to trade on your team for what the other team is doing. Um, for example, combustion. Again, fire mages are really popular. And Revival is a minute and a half cooldown. Combustion is a two-minute cooldown, but it normally gets reduced to like a minute and a half. So those cooldowns kind of line up really well. So whenever I see Combustion, I, I use my Revival. Because I, I feel like with my team's defensives, it's just the best way to counter it without having to overlap too many cooldowns. And then another example, Warriors. Again, like I think by far the most popular melee. Their, their damage mostly comes during Warbreaker, which is a 45 second cooldown, 45 second cooldown. And Miss Weavers have a disarm that is 45 seconds. So I would say try to learn. Well, because everyone plays a different team, like a different comp. So look at your team, look at your defensives, and try to figure out the best way to deal with what the other team has. Is so if, kinda... if a player is not playing these other characters to learn the defensives, mm -hmm. They yeah. just go on a website and look up the cooldowns, and then you're building kind of like a yeah. mental map. Did you ever put this down on paper? Or, oh, well, I am the writer for the Icy Veins PvP guides, uh -huh. and uh, I wrote all of them at first. I think for all of Legion and all of BFA, so I knew every rotation, every defensive, every offensive cooldown. So you kind of have it, in, have it in your head, but but a new player yeah. might just like you just suggest them just write it all down just have like yeah. a little map of like this cool, yeah. of this cooldown you know mm -hmm. or use a mind map actually where you can import the icon yeah yeah it's something like that any anything to help you track it or just look at it and and try to deal with it that's i would recommend yeah definitely um, awesome that's very helpful yeah. i think especially yeah. the the aspect about reviewing vods i think that there's mm -hmm. a there's an actual coaching sciences component to that yeah. We know that this... You remember earlier how I was talking about the error recognition part of the brain? Yeah. Uh, it really only lasts for 15 to 45 seconds. So okay. your opportunity to improve after an error is closed mm -hmm. at that point. Oh. And so okay. when you're, so you're post-game and you know, you're talking about the game, uh, there's not a... There's, like there is some strategic learning that can do or like when you're watching somebody play a stream like you're yeah. learning maybe some knowledge but it's not really integrating into how it is that you're reacting in the game right that's right. that happens when you're actually playing that's yeah. why you have sports casters and sports yeah. athletes you know <laughs> yeah. and then yeah. those are different people um yeah. because analysts can't do that's what that's the different the difference <laughs> between them yeah. um but but if you are watching the vod and you're able to really like image that part or you're really to put mm -hmm. yourself back in that in that position you can kind of like feel the the stress and the pressure and the anxiety and the and the frustration with yourself for that mistake like you can yeah. recapture some of that learning from the moment of the mistake at the moment of the mistake aspect yeah um there is there are only theories that support this there is no actual hard evidence uh from brain oh. scans that show that this is the fact but okay there is enough um i think anecdotal evidence from like uh, sports where people watch tape a lot like basketball um, yeah. and League of Legends uh, and even like WoW Arena for example Yeah, there's definitely enough anecdotal evidence and then enough background in the theory to say that like um, like for example we know that when you do imagery you can fire the electrons uh, sorry not the electrons the neurons um, all the way up to the point where they contact your muscle 
like the exact wow. same one. So you can like, you can like imagine a basketball shot, for example, and you will literally fire in your brain, like the motor neurons and the actual yeah. peripheral neurons all the way up to the point where they touch the muscle um, and then stop there. And so mm. you can replicate the, the movement like fully internally. Uh, so we know that enough from like explorations like this, that this is probably the case that VOD watching probably is very important for that reason. Uh, yeah. And that the more you, you put yourself into the VOD, or the, the you know the replay of your game, the like the better essentially. Oh, definitely. Yeah. I even my voice or when I'm watching when I'm watching other people, I try to put myself in their shoes. And actually, I did it more with Hearthstone because you kind of have time to react. But I would just say, what would I do in this situation? Like, if this was me healing, what would I do? How would I react to this? And I kind of put myself in their shoes, and and just see if they make the same choice and see if they get punished for it. Or see if they would make a different choice, and it's actually better than what I what I would have done. So I kind of I kind of do that sometimes, and it's probably more useful for like Hearthstone or you know Magic the Gathering, where it's kind of slower. But yeah, or there's only one or two choices because I think in WoW you can make, and probably League too. You there's probably like a dozen choices you can make that might pay off or it might not. So did you? Um... But that's. Did you pause the VOD at Hearthstone or the stream and then think these things, or were you just kind of thinking yeah. as it went? I would pause it and then I, I wouldn't pause. I would think I would look at their situation and I would kind of give myself the same amount of time that they had, and then and say, "All right," did. and see what they did. And in my brain, I'd be like, "All right, I would do this in this situation, but like, what are they doing? Is it paying off for and them?" Did you ever do that thing in Arena or M Plus? Oh yeah, oh yeah. Okay. In Mythic this Plus, is no. Really interesting. Yeah, okay, so Mythic Plus, I kind of just yellowed it, really. I just learned the mechanics and then just healed. So but, there's, there's, two, there's, there's two pieces of science around, around this. One is the science mm-hmm. of, like, feedback. Um, peer feedback, expert feedback, self-feedback. Mm-hmm. Uh, we know that the feedback window is, like, is like really close, same as, same as, um, uh, same as the, the brain recognizes a mistake. The closer that you get the feedback to the actual mistake, the, the mm-hmm. more effective it is for learning. So if you're able to get feedback like instantly, so for example, you you push pause and you think like, okay, what would I do? And you do this or this and you choose yeah. one and then you push play and you get the feedback instantly. Mm-hmm. Um, then that's like much more powerful neurologically for learning. And then the okay. second the second piece of research, there's this research on doctors uh, uh, diagnosing cancer where they were trying to like improve their efficacy. And what they did was they created a bunch of flashcards uh, where they would like have an actual real life like image of you mm-hmm. know uh, an x-ray or something like that or an mri and they would say like okay is there cancer here or not and then they would instantly tell them like yes you were right or no you were wrong uh oh, wow. and so you would you would know right away essentially like it was like a performance because normally yeah. how it works with doctors is like they see the thing and they say okay let's get a biopsy i think there's cancer or not and then they wait two weeks for the appointment and then right. they wait like three weeks for the you know the return of the thing and then they're like talk so the feedback loop is really 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 long yeah. Um, and it's useless. So what they were doing was essentially creating like flashcard performance trainers for doctors. And it was wildly, wildly successful in improving yeah. accuracy of cancer diagnosis. Wow. Um, and so what you're doing is literally the same thing, but something that we have done also in League of Legends is like you pause and you say like, okay, what would, what, this is the best team in the world, right? And they're in this situation. Yeah. What would you guys do? And we talk about it for a second and then we push play and we see what like the best team in the world did yeah. with that with that situation. That's so powerful for learning um, yeah. because you're putting yourself like, you're going from viewer where you're just watching the game and like third person omniscient perspective and you can see everything and you have time to think and like your mistakes don't really matter. Uh, yeah. and you can't learn anything from that setup really. I mean, you can learn a little bit, but not like actually... Uh, and you're then you're turning it into this tool that's kind of like a flashcard tool, which we know can actually improve performance, at least in doctors prescribing cancer, yeah. and also probably in a lot of other things. But we don't have research to back that up. Yeah, um, that's, I, that's a super cool technique. Yeah, that's what I've been doing, and I did it for wrestling too. My coach was a, a science teacher in high school. That was where what he, he just said: imagine you're wrestling this kid, and then play each scenario out in your brain. That way. If it happens, you already know what to do. You don't, you don't need to think. You just know what to do. And I kind of just took it into WoW where if I'm watching somebody play Miss Weaver, I put them, put myself in their shoes. And if I was in their situation, I wouldn't. I don't have time to pause the game. I'm I'm playing right now. I'm just 
where they are and kind of just trying to see what they're doing. If it'd be different from what I would do. All right. So now we have a bunch of takeaways. The agenda, having having your drive clarified, mm-hmm. doing these little mini games, like yeah. keep pe- keep my teammates alive. Okay, I can do that now, like adding on to it. Yep. Um, reviewing your VODs, having a plan for which cooldowns are going to counter which cooldowns, mm-hmm. um, and taking the game seriously instead of flippantly. Yep. Uh, and, and this last one, which was uh, flashcarding yourself. When you're watching other people who are experts, like you have this, you have this mirror and model approach, which I like to push. Which is like you need to have a vision of what the perfect game looks like. Yeah, if you want to improve fast. So right. either you need to have a vision of like what that looks like, or you need to watch people who are really good, and be like, okay, that's what it looks like to be good. Yeah. And therefore, like, how can I get there? Uh, and then you look yeah. at your model and you go look at your vod, and you're like, wow, I don't look at all like that person. So what am I doing wrong? <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. I, 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 I don't know if I thought of this on my own, but there's it's something, it's like a mental library. And in PvP, you might just encounter one scenario, but maybe in a few games, so you encounter the same scenario and you reacted poorly the first game, and then in the second game, you try to react differently. I, I think each game you play in Arena is like another addition to the library of the scenario you're in. I, I don't know how to explain it, but like each game... Is something you can improve upon. You have a scenario, let's just say a rogue blinds me, right? And I trink it instantly, but they didn't commit any cooldowns, and then I die. So I have that I have that scenario. I remember that scenario. And then let's say I queue into another rogue and I blind, I get blinded, but I don't trink it instantly. And then but they commit a cooldown and then my teammate dies. I, it's hard to explain. And then the third time you queue into a rogue, a few games down the line, you get blinded and maybe you don't train, you hold on to your trigger a little bit and then you actually, you you know, you use a cooldown for once and then you just keep stacking on top of like previous knowledge until, you know, you've seen every single scenario. So you know how to react. Yeah. This is like a, a defect of esport training, which mm-hmm. is that unlike traditional sports, we can't just run 50 drills in a row. We can't just like yeah. be like, okay, rogue blind me and go. And then just like right. pause. Okay, yeah, you died. Okay, r- okay, ready. Get set. Blind me. Go. You know, yeah. you can't like you can't just run the blind drill like a hundred times yeah. like you could on the wrestling mat or like in a soccer right. pitch where you could just have people like shooting free throws like all day. Yeah. Um, we have to actually scrimmage in order to learn, and so this mm-hmm. ability to like bookmark your play library and be like okay, in this live match, I am learning how to counter rogues. And then you play like seven mages in a row uh, yeah. with no, you know, with a holy paladin or something. And then you're like, then you get another rogue match. And you're like, what was I doing again? Like, oh, yeah, right. Something. Yeah. I feel like that maybe you yeah. need like tools to help with that, to like remember yeah. what you did. But, but also, yeah, if you have the ability, the capacity to remember the, the little things you're working on those matchups, mm-hmm. which is definitely possible. I know because oh, I'm yeah. doing it and I'm only like 1600 rating. So, yeah. It's definitely possible to do now already, uh, even at a low rating, to just remember like, okay, this is what I'm working on against mages. Like I'm working yeah. on not getting polymorphed, you know? Yeah. No, oh, um, yeah. And then you go in next time and do that. Yeah. Okay. I, I don't know if everybody does this, but like I remember every loss from like the past two weeks and I replay them in my brain. Every single I don't know why. I could just I just see them. I could see them in my brain. And I just remember every time every loss and not, not the wins it's only the losses and i just remember that i, I replayed them over and over and over i just keep thinking about what i could have done to do better i think that I that's a good that's a good cutoff talent for people yeah. so people always ask like what's the difference between like um environment and talent like in esport like for example in nba we know that like height is not something you can train no matter what right but we also know that like height isn't predictive of success in the mm-hmm. nba uh, so it's not necessarily that it's a talent. It's more like if you don't have it, you can't be in the NBA. And if you do have it, you, m- you may yeah. or may not, you know, it's like right. a cutoff. It's like at least, yeah. Uh, yeah. kind of like minimum, but it's not like a talent. I feel yeah. like what you just described is like that thing. So I have run into plenty of esport athletes who cannot remember what happened in the game that they just played accurately. Oh. Meaning yeah. they're like, they're like, you know, they're going through and they're describing what happened and they're explaining what happened and they're totally wrong. And if we go back and look at the video, they're like, oh, wow, that's what happened. 
Yeah. Um, and they're never any good. <laughs> like, yeah. They're just not, they never get to, like, they might be pros. Yeah. Like, I, I've run into some who are pros, right? So they're, like, yeah. making out other things. But they, like, they, they, they either don't last long or they can't make it very far. And then the people yeah. who can, like, literally have a, have a play-by-play perfect... Yeah like replica of the game and every single thing that they clicked going through their right. head yeah. after the game. Those are the people that, that are just like learning from, from yeah. what they did still when they're sleeping that night. Right. That, exactly. Um, yeah. I, I can go to VODs from a month or two ago and I can like download and start editing it. And I can just remember every, I remember every game. Every so, single one. So I if see you it. don't have that right now, like if you're watching this and you're like, that's not me. Like I can't remember what games I played today. Um, mm. That should be like your your tell. That like maybe you're not going to be good at this. But also, <laughs> luckily, this is a trainable skill. Oh, good. Um, I, yeah. So the way that you start to prioritize it and find out if you can do this is that you watch your VOD directly after the game with a test first. So the first thing you do after every single arena match, you have to find somebody to queue with who doesn't mind the break, by the way, because you have to take a break after every arena match. Maybe you can bundle up into five matches, you know? Mm -hmm. So if you're queuing with a random solo queuer, uh, you know, you you play whatever to like quit, you know, to like quit on you or you play five, six (laughs) matches. And then you just, you go and you like replay it in your head as Mm -hmm. best as you can. And then you go watch the video and you see what you got wrong. Yeah. And that starts to hone that skill. <clears throat> so if you're lucky, like Justin, like his life <laughs> trained him in this. So like it yeah, just right. happens, right? Uh, he yeah. didn't have to go through this. But if you're not lucky, um, unlike uh, NBA, where you just need to be tall, you we have this stretching <laughs> machine where you can lay on it. It's like a rack and it'll oh make you God. taller, you know? We're like, cutting out your shins and lengthening the body. <laughs> but anyway, it's possible. It's possible to improve that. Um, it might just not happen, you know, in a year or two. So yeah. apologies. Um, do you think that the stream anxiety helps you improve? Like when you play off stream, <sighs> do you, do you, you, you care about mistakes less because like you're not blushing and you're not like super embarrassed in them. So they don't hit you more. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. When I'm off stream, and I make a mistake. I kind of, I don't even need to play it all. Like, I just know I made a mistake. You know, I don't need to say anything or. Because I just know I did, but for, I don't know. It's when I stream and I make a mistake. That's obvious. It's just embarrassing to me because I'm expected to not make a mistake, or maybe maybe I expect myself not to make a mistake, like uh, like a bad mistake, and I and I just did it. And how many times I make that mistake? I made that mistake like fifty times. Why would I make that mistake? Um, Do you and think it helps I, you? not make it again the embarrassment yeah. as like a pressure. Yeah. yeah oh yeah yeah definitely because I, I i don't want to embarrass myself further so i tr- really try not to make the same mistake twice yeah the yeah. example i always give is of um for learning it's like people are like well i don't know why i didn't learn that like i went and i studied it um you know, yeah. the other guy. And, and the example I give is language learning where you have, let's say you have two students in high school. Okay. They're both learning Spanish. One of them has to go and memorize a list of 20 words. And the other person okay. has to recite uh, a sentence in class. Okay. And the person mm-hmm. goes and studies the list of 20 words and like they, they learn all the words. So let's say they learn most of them. The, okay. They remember them. And then a year later, two years later, somebody asked them and they kind of, they forgotten it, you know? Yeah. Um, Cause they just had to use it for that one test. Yeah. yeah. And then you have the person who's reciting the thing in class. They mess up the pronunciation or the meaning of the word. The teacher just points a finger at them and starts laughing maniacally. The entire class of 20 oh. students starts laughing at them and pointing at them and shames them like literally out of the room. Like they run out into the yeah. hallway crying, right? They'll hide in the bathroom. <laughs> yeah. yeah. For, the, for the rest of their life, for the next 50 years that they're like alive until they have dementia, <laughs> um, yeah. they never forget that word ever, oh, yeah. like, ever again. So you would say that thing is now learned right you wouldn't right. necessarily yeah. say that it was like it was like you know they didn't study it, it and memorize purpose. it yeah. at home and like get ready for a test and have flashcards. cards right. like their brain memorized that word for eternity because of yeah. the biochemical status the brain was in <laughs> when that thing happened right when the mistake happened yeah. so yeah. <laughs> there's something to be said for going on stage and making mistakes and feeling that pressure and like having it encode in your memory these yeah these problems of course there's a bad side to it too because it could like you could be excoriated for doing something correct that looks bad 
Yeah. And then start to act that way. So like that happens a lot. Max was actually saying this in the race race for world first mm-hmm. interview about like Raiders, how like when yep. they started streaming, they had people who would die and it might be like a good death. But yeah. Then the stream would meme it and then they would play yeah. to not die instead of playing for the victory of the raid. Yeah. Um and so they would be learning these bad habits. So like I think that this might be a double edged sword for you as well. Um but my guess would be that streaming overall provided an, an enhancement to your level of like learning yeah it took me a while to actually start streaming like i i made my twitch i think in 2014 but i didn't stream until like 2017 really um i mostly just uploaded youtube videos i because i couldn't get past the fact that people would see me lose like not even make a mistake i could play perfect but lose and there was just something about i don't know people seeing me lose that I thought maybe it's not embarrassing, but would have diminished what I've done because on YouTube, people pretty much just see the games where I win, right? Because I I won this game. So let me show you how to win. But people seeing me lose, I felt weird because it was the first time people were seeing me lose. Uh, would people still think I'm good at the game? Uh, kind of like mental blocks like that. But yeah, I think overall it's been pretty, pretty helpful. Yeah. Did you um, have the same amount of pressure, whether you had like one viewer or like 100 viewers? Yeah. Uh, I actually, I don't really see how many viewers I have. I actually I stream to myself for like a few years as well. Um, but yeah, even if there was one person watching, I, just knowing that one person saw either a mistake or like me lose would just, I don't know, mentally just not not be good for me. Yeah. So yeah. so this is this is a tool that like, almost anybody can use like you don't need to have an audience you can stream and like either zero or even one person could be watching you don't even know in the middle of the match if somebody tunes in right yeah. so like and you can hide your viewers too mm-hmm. so you can just like feel that like eye on you yeah that just oh, yeah. stresses you out and forces you yeah. to like kind of like like pretend that you're on stage essentially it's yeah like a really and great then, substitution for a live tournament and then she, streaming i feel is unique because then you have people that can actually like message you and like you read it and they ask you, like, oh, why'd you do this? I'm just like, I, I made a mistake. Thank you. Thank you. I know. I know I messed up. So, yeah, like that level Do you ever as find well. yourself admitting to something to your streaming audience that you cannot admit to your teammate? Like, your teammate confronts you and, like, you effed up here. And you're like, <laughs> no, I didn't. You effed. But, like, your streamers, your audience would ask, like, hey, why'd you do this? And you'd be like, yeah, because I screwed up. No, normally I'm pretty open. I've played with people like that. Uh, where you know they'll be like oh you know i don't know try to blame somebody but then to their stream be like oh no i, I kind of messed up but me i just i say it how it is i try to be as real as i can you know i feel like people can see fake people i don't like to be fake so i try to keep it as real as i can i, I say when i make a mistake yeah i mean that just betrays a connection to like how you actually feel about something like if you if you have to be defensive verbally to the people that you're trying to trust yeah. and respect and have respect from it's generally mm-hmm. because you're afraid of their judgment of you so yeah. if you care more about your judgment of yourself than your teammates judgment of you then like that's a really important step like yeah i i, I really even still games today i still try to blame every i it might be bad but i still blame every loss myself and i start if i start here if we lose a game and one of my teammates is like oh you know i messed up here i'd be like you know what honestly you played perfect i messed up here we can win that game and hopefully we get them again. So, yeah, well, th- this is actually an aspect of leadership too, because like, regardless of how it helps you as an individual, um, a lot of times winning a team game means figuring out for your teammates, what it is that they need to hear to get better rather than mm-hmm. what it is that you want to say to them to make yourself yeah. feel better. It, and most yeah. of the time in online ranked yeah. esports, like of any game, what we say to our teammates is the thing that we want to say that we want them to hear from us to make yeah, us feel yeah. better. Yeah. Not at all what it is that that person needs to hear to improve. And so like, yeah. if, you, if you like taking the blame, generally speaking, that's like, that is the thing that people need to hear in order to start thinking productively. They're like, wait, no, it wasn't his fault. Like I could have done something better too. And um, then they start to like step forward and learn instead of like being locked yeah. in this defensiveness. Yeah. Um, no, I bet a- it makes your teammates better too. Yeah, I, I do that a lot, and it's it's weird because I'll do that a lot, but sometimes my partners are in my stream, 
but then someone in my stream will comment on one of my teammates and what they did wrong. And then I, it, it's weird. It's kind of weird because it's like they're trying to defend themselves against someone in my chat, but I'm, I'm, but I'm saying they did nothing wrong. So he doesn't even need to worry about it. So it is kind of weird, but I found that the best way is to like take a lot of blame. I mean, if it's your fault, I, I, I tend to take blame. And then, you know, just if someone was out of position, just like, just try not to position like that and we'll be fine. And it seems to work out, you know, some people, most people are positive about it. Yeah, I think, I mean, I think that's really key for people who are trying to lead their own team is to understand that like the drill sergeant leadership kind of thing where you're like yelling at people and like forcing them to get better because mm. you're telling them, don't screw up, don't screw up. Like <laughs> that's not real life. I think that's just the movies, yeah. right? Yeah, the, yeah. The way that you, that you forge like a team that, where people are vulnerable with each other and therefore can be vulnerable with themselves and improve mm. is through this like emotionally intelligent way of like understanding that people feel shame when they make mistakes right. and then they need a way to step forward into accepting it. And yeah. not a lot of people that you play with are going to have this like radical acceptance of failure. Um, this is something that you don't even get at the pro level until like, you know, five years experience mm -hmm. in and lots of sports psychology sessions. So <laughs> like a really quick band-aid solution is like, what Justin does, like take the blame for himself. <laughs> and if you actually believe it, like it sounds like he does, then yeah. it opens up his teammates to like actually just focusing on their own improvement and like trying not to let him down because they feel bad, you know, themselves that they, when they mess yeah. up. Yeah, because my team now, we've only been queuing since season one of Shadowlands. Um, a lot of my friends don't really play too much or they don't really play too much anymore. And then some of my teammates, they got their Gladiator, they got 2400, and then they didn't really want to push more. And that's my goal is to keep pushing higher and higher. Mm -hmm. um, so I think having a common goal is also really good to have with your team or guild right. in general. Um, but yeah, I found, because I've had a lot of teams over the year, a lot of teams, and just taking responsibility for what you did and don't blame other people or like put all, don't put the entire loss on somebody just kind of figure out what mistakes we could have each individually done better and then kind of come back as a team and just improve on the next game it has helped a lot. I have to say that um, I, p I played a lot of World of Warcraft mm -hmm. since I bought it the day it came out in stores. Oh, wow. Yeah. In November of 2004. <laughs> yeah. Um, thank goodness I was already graduated from college then because otherwise it would have like ruined my college. Yeah, like, I would have failed, oh. definitely failed out of school, right? And that's but, why I got a C average in college. So okay, yeah, don't worry so about exactly it. Exactly the problem. <laughs> um, so I have to say that I, I played a little bit in TBC. I would not equate it to like mm. actual PVP now. Okay. Like arenas at the time were like kind of like this fun new thing. Um, mm -hmm. Like a mini game. Yeah. And, yeah. and at the time, like I was full raid gear resto druid. So it was more like just laughing oh. and running around and healing warriors i as they I like, was doing the same thing almost everybody so it was like <laughs> yeah. it was like if you were if you were a pve raider it was like a joke right yeah um, yeah <laughs> but uh but so when i started playing again like this patch the thing that i noticed was that it was both the worst and the best experiences that i had with other people in terms mm -hmm. of like maturity of response that uh, yep. like it just went off the scale. It was like I encountered the most unbelievably toxic raging that I've ever seen in yeah. World of Warcraft. And then I experienced a level of maturity and like kindness than I have ever seen out of anybody in any PVE environment where they yeah. were just like, hey man, like that was it was just like very communicative and supportive and helpful and chill and like taking the worst absolute disastrous performance and just mm -hmm. like, writing it off and being like totally cool like you know blah 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 like everybody yeah. makes mistakes and and i feel like what i feel like is that just like with all the other faceless online competitive ranking system games out there mm -hmm. it's like a forge it's like a thing that like burns away all of the like impure materials and leaves just the iron and if you happen to be made out of iron you end up yeah. like kind of like better off and if you happen to be made out of junk like you end up like this yeah. toxic morsel of of negativity um yeah at least that's that's the way that i see that like this element seems to be functioning in, in wow yeah i wish i could explain it um i honestly i just don't play with people that are toxic whether whether they're good i've played with multi-rank ones that are 
extremely toxic and that I only play one or two games with them. I, I can't do it. I, I, I can't. I want to have fun as well. I want to win, but I also want to have fun and I'm not going to. I don't know. I'm not going to be around that. I, I just can't. And I've also met really some of the kindest people in, in PVE and PVP. Both. Um, it's. I don't know. It's. It, it's random. I feel like sometimes. Yeah. Um. Do you. Do you feel like that you learned anything essential in WoW PVP that you didn't learn? from competing in wrestling or other sports or do you feel like it's it's like literally like the same kind of like setup psychologically for you to me psychologically it's the same exact thing i'm just using different skills um in wrestling it was physical but i think it was mostly mental um a mental strength it's not like football where it's just like you can actually just be faster than somebody Right. Yeah. Wrestling. Cause I wasn't the strongest, um, wrestler out there. Um, I was more, I, I did cross country, so I was more, um, in shape and I, I was more durable, but I was not strong at all. So I had to mentally prepare to wrestle an entire wrestling match. And then normally in the third period is when I would win because the other guy is so tired and I'm meant like, and I'm, I like, I'm tired, but I'm not showing it. Uh, and I just keep going hard every single t- every second of the match. Isn't and that literally how Mistweavers win too? It's that is like liter- outlasting. Liter- outla- literally exactly how Mistweavers play. Wow. And yeah, that's just... And I just... I truly applied that to Mistweaver. I said, you know what? We might not win fast, but we'll win later. You know? So that's... Really, that's just... I applied it to Mistweaver, essentially. Yeah. So that's really similar to... um If I'm comparing like esports setups i've often compared league of legends to the marathon because what happens mm. is you need to have full concentration for like 50 minutes or 40 minutes yeah. and you make one mistake and it's like you spend the next 35 minutes trying to make up for that mistake <laughs> slowly yeah. slowly and you cannot make another mistake and also you have to play better mm. than perfect to make it up right and it's kind of like uh well, you're a distance runner, but like if you're playing like a very, very long PvP match and your like goal mm. is like, okay, we're just gonna win in late, you have to yeah. literally play perfect. And then if you make one mistake, you just lose. Yeah. It's soul crushing because you could be like uh, so you could be like ten percent of the way from winning and like just run a bad split on your mile or like stumble or something, and then it's yeah. just like you never can recover. You just don't have time. Yeah. When we're oh. late in dampening and the other healers drinking, I tell my teammates don't even worry about it. We'll just keep making this game go longer. Like I really th- and Miss Weavers, we don't have a lot of cooldowns to trade. So already, if you make a mistake, whether it's a long game or a short game, <laughs> you gotta you gotta make up for it somehow. You can't really make mistakes. Um, but yeah, I tell my teammates, don't worry about it. Let's just do damage, and we'll beat them later in the game. That's really interesting. I wonder if there is evidence. Then, if we started to look about what kind of competitions people are attracted to, like in mm-hmm. sport, and they're like rate, oh. they're like one to one, like you know. Like their uh, sport, yeah. Sport and esport. Because I, I had this. Um, I have noticed a ton of carryover uh, from injured athletes who were like competing at a very, very high level in their sport, mm-hmm. became injured, and then needed a way to express their competitive stress. Like they just had to get it out. They were like, "I must yeah. compete," and they ended up in esport. And of course, because of their drive, they ended up at the top really quickly. So. Yeah. I can count off the top of my head, just like on one hand, like five athletes that I've worked with who were exact same story. And um, really, wow. and all of their sports kind of correlated with how it is that League of Legends is competed in. Um, wow. And you, your sports correlate with kind of like in a similar way to the class, even the class that you picked in yeah. PVP. Oh no, yeah, yeah. So I wonder if there's like a there's like a background there that we could look at psychologically. Would, would be, I feel like it'd be like a, one of those personality tests, which are fun to look at, but like not actually real science, you know? I, yeah. I think that would still be interesting though, to see some kind of correlation between them. Someone who likes faster, like games, maybe plays a master, faster paced class or something like that. I think that'd be kind of cool. Um, one of the last questions I had about your uh, particular setup in Mm -hmm. terms of like a competitive mindset and how it is that you learn and think is um, comes out of me watching like your educational content where I was attracted to it because you're one of the few people who actually narrates their decision sequence. And like when you're learning something, 
getting the heuristic. Heuristic is like the decision making process, essentially like the mm-hmm. checklist that people have in their brain for like what to do when. Um, yep. Getting the heuristic out of a like top level player is one of the most valuable things that can exist in the game anywhere. So your content is like incredibly unique in that you actually describe like just like what you're thinking, chain of consciousness. But that's yeah super hard to do. It takes oh, me. Yeah seasons of training to get my league athletes to even talk at all during the game much less to like narrate their decision making sequence out as it goes so how did you become able to narrate while you were playing um Mm. because this is a this is a problem in league of legends uh especially for people who are transitioning from playing solo to playing on a team yeah uh, where communication is necessary and uh um and, and how would you suggest like other people kind of like tackle this idea of yeah. know, kind of narrating their decision process? Yeah, there was, I think there's really two reasons. The first one was I really wanted to start streaming more, but I was anxious because I, I used to never talk when I played um, unless obviously I, unless I was in voice. And one of the biggest suggestions they tell streamers is to narrate what you're doing. So what I would do is I would just practice. What am I doing? In, what am I doing? you know, in arena. So I would just practice to myself. I would stream to myself essentially and just narrate what I'm doing. And then the second thing is I watched high level players do the same thing. So I don't know if you know, uh, go Uh, he, he high, one of the best healers in the game. I think he recently quit. Um, but he used to do exactly what I did. He used to narrate everything, every decision he made, he would do and, and he would say it. And watching somebody go through the thought process of okay i'm positioning here so i can do this i'm trading this cooldown because of this that was and then i kind of just took what he did and applied it to what i did and just started narrating everything every decision i made because it's weird i'm thinking about the decision but it happens instantly there's no thought to it when i'm making a decision and i'm trying to react to something um but yeah it is good and bad because you're kind of, I don't know, you're processing two different things. You're you're trying to explain what you're trying to do, and then you're actually trying to do it. And sometimes they kind of get out of sync. Right. Where it's like, oh, I should do this. But then I, it takes me like a little bit to do it. Cause it and then people don't really understand, like, why does it take me so long to do something? But they don't understand that. It's, not e- it's really not easy to like co- live commentate and then also do it at the same time. It's, yeah, it's very challenging. Yeah. Until you automate. Right. Yeah. And even then it's like interfering a little bit with your full, oh, full concentration. Yeah, and then yeah, and then like in arena especially cuz I do it in keystones as well and it's a little bit easier in keystones, but in arena I'm trying to commentate, make decisions and then also look at what all the other teams are doing and look at what my team's doing. So it's like a lot of a lot of layers to it, but it, it's helped me. I, I don't know if it's helpful or not, but I like doing it. I, I I enjoy just commentating it. Yeah. Well, it, it's definitely valuable for people who don't have a good remem- like memory of their mm-hmm. game and what they were thinking because then when they watch the VOD, it's on there. For yeah. you, it doesn't sound like that's an issue because you were literally able to replay the game and your thought process kind of like already. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's like probably good for people who are learning that skill. But then, yeah, for, yeah. for content creators, it's it's oh, yeah. a redeemably good skill. Yeah. Um, all right. I, w- I also wanted to talk a little bit about like uh, PvP in general in World of Warcraft, like from the Blizzard's yeah. perspective. Do you mm-hmm. think that that WoW PvP is like imbalanced and fair and fun? Does it need to be fair to be fun? Like, what w- <sighs> what is your comparison between WoW PvP and the other esports that are out there? Yeah, that are competitive, um, where the, which is like person versus person. I think WoW PvP is fun. But there are times like now where certain things are so broken for so long that there needs to be some kind of change. Windwalker monks, for example. I mean, I've died in 0.2 seconds to them. And this is, and it's not just me. It's constantly over the course of maybe three or four months now and nothing has changed. Um, That stuff isn't enjoyable, but... When I don't play an arena match versus a Windwalker, I think overall the games are fun. It's just hard for newer players to start playing the game. Yeah. So I heard like th- three comments basically. One is that, yeah, generally it's like a 
it's like a well-designed kind of fun game and yeah. two, that the they need to take care of like outliers much faster. for sure they have no oh yeah like no response time to mm-hmm. things that are actually a problem in pvp yeah it's way too slow yeah um, because it's not their main focus probably yeah. i would guess and you know you and i we play the worst healer in the game but it's still i i i, I still have fun you know like i still have a fun time queuing arena queuing threes twos it's yeah it might it's be fun. fun because we're playing the worst healing game. Like, well, that's give also a true too. Like, yeah, you right. this mental escape already. That's like yeah, a secret. yeah, you're right. <laughs> yeah. So some people like I've always I've always tried to play the worst class. Like in vanilla, I played yeah. paladin tank. Oh, in PvE. oh, there you go. Like in Nax, oh, you know, geez. I was tanking Nax yeah. Ramus with like a paladin tank. So My God. I would literally yeah. get one shot by <laughs> some of the mechanics. Yeah. Um, before that was before they allowed anything but warrior to be the tank. Um, exactly. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so there is an element to that, but uh, but yeah, I think, and and then the last thing you mentioned was um, that the learning curve is so drastic that there's it, no like it's massive. There's no like yeah. fun way to enter it. The only way mm-hmm. to enter it is like through this very stressful kind of. Yeah, it, it's definitely more stressful than fun when you're first learning. Unless you go in with expectations of just queuing, having fun, you're gonna lose. You might win. Um, then sure, yeah, that's fine. But if even if you're slightly competitive and want to win, it can be. Or if even if you want to just learn the game, it can be overwhelming and not really the most fun. Do you think it would be that, better if they obscured the MMR ranking up to like a certain point, up to like sixteen hundred or something, where you just like didn't see the win and loss like numbers that you got on your on your rating, so so that people just focused on the play and not on the like. The group and who was messing up yeah I, I that or i wish skirmishes were more popular where rating doesn't matter you just queue into people and it's essentially for fun and learning something like that i wish it, that was just more popular yeah the whole group having to find a group and then queue as a group is definitely mm-hmm. different like i feel like all games have competitive ladder rank games have moved away from that they've gone to a system where you queue as an individual it looks at your MMR and it puts you mm-hmm. on a balanced team and then it like hides your, your gain. Yeah. And, and then every single game that you play, you get some rank. You never lose anything. Yeah. So you're always like, See, gaining, you either gain like one point or you gain seven yeah. points if you win. And and they got rid of the whole losing points thing visually, even yeah. though it's behind the scenes. In the yeah. See, Mythic Plus is similar to that. You don't lose rating in Mythic Plus, which I always found kind of interesting. You only gain, you can yeah. get plus zero which is, you know, you don't time the key, but you don't lose rating ever. It's right. just plus. And I, I was thinking about that for Arena, and I, you know, I thought that was kind of interesting. I don't know how it could potentially be implemented, but... It, well, I mean, if you, both yeah. um, StarCraft and League of Legends and Valorant and CSGO mm-hmm. also, uh, and even Dota, all moved away from the naked... Um, ELO rating, which is kind of mm-hmm. like what PvP still has, and they moved towards yeah. a matchmaking rating, so they could use okay. their own formula. Oh, and then they moved from a matchmaking rating being public to one that's hidden, mm. and they put like ranks instead. Yeah, uh, except for Dota. Dota still has like strict ELO, I think. But yeah. like, but basically, like your matchmaking rating fluctuates and goes up and down the same way that your WoW rating would, but they just yeah. don't show it to anybody you're not yeah. allowed to look at it and then yeah. they just and then and then if you win a game uh they give you you know plus seven points and if you know if you lose a game you get anywhere from zero to two depending on like they they when once they have the freedom of the matchmaking rating they're free to say like mm. well you lost harder than somebody else on your team yeah right like, right or or better because they can look at elements in the game and then they could say like you earned at least a point and then you're yeah. always just accruing points you're never like even yeah. every single time you play a game you get at least a point or two points or, you know, it's not like yeah. seven points. And then they just scaled up the points of everything so that like, yeah, it takes I, a while. I feel like that, that might be good because the way the system is in WoW now, you're kind of, not forced, but you're encouraged to queue with the same people because you have the same MMR, you're around the same rating. So why would you risk losing more points queuing with other people? Okay. Yeah, exactly. Um, but in Hearthstone, I was thinking they have breakpoints as well when you rank up, where you get to a point you, they still show you, you know, you know, you progress higher. But then if you get you get to a point where if you're at a if you make a certain thresh point or a threshold, you don't lose beyond that point. So like in WoW, let's just say you hit twenty one hundred, and then 
you go above 2100, you're 2150, and then you lose like 10 games. If it was implemented in a while, you wouldn't drop below 2100. You would just not lose any rating, but you can keep going higher. I thought that would be cool because I, there's a lot of risk, you know? Uh, it doesn't encourage you, you to play with new with new players. Right. So you're limited. So like an already limited participant pool is limited even further to like Ex- this 100 I, c- point band around where ex- you are. Exactly, because I'm trying to think in Mythic Plus, imagine if you did lose rating. Would I, somebody who just wanted to do keystones with a pug or try to find a group, would anyone queue with me and risk losing their rating on a healer they never played with before? I would, I would probably never get with a Mistweaver at it, all. Exactly. I, 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 it takes me like three hours to get invited. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Um, but like, I probably, I probably, I don't get even invited now. And it's only plus. So imagine if you actually lost rating, right. if you didn't time a key, I, no, there's no chance I would get invited. So, yeah, there's I think this it needs whole some psychological aspect of rating that is really mm-hmm. has an impact on why people. Oh yeah, queue up. Yeah. yeah, I I don't even look at my rating. I, I can't. It, it actually does. I try to find. I try to make a script that hides my rating because it, I get really anxious about it in because, PvP or in PvP. Yeah, yeah. So because I don't. If that's the case. Then yeah. it's probably that. It's only negative. Yeah. Like if there's no reason for you to want to see it, right? So like yeah. for, it would it would be a sign of a good system if you actually wanted to see your rating after a yeah. win or a loss. Or you wanted yeah. to see whatever it is that they present to you. you know? Right. Yeah. I it's not that much it doesn't really bother me. It's actually the people that watch. They constantly ask, Oh, what's your rating? And like, oh, what MMR and stuff like that. And if I'm on a loose streak, I don't want to you know, like, like yeah, I get. I, I've lost a lot. All right, let's relax, guys. Yeah, I get it. Um, it I, I feel like when it comes to rating, it's never really a positive thing. It's more of I remember when it's negative, but that might just be me. So well, maybe, maybe some people like to see it. This is a positive thing how they implemented this uh, mythic plus rating into the game. Yeah, and this Torghast rating, like mm-hmm. maybe now they'll think about like doing something with the PvP lab yeah. system and changing it away from. They kind of have, like, breakpoints in terms of gear. Right, yeah, gear, yeah. And then, yeah. yeah. All right. um, Do you think Blizzard can esportify esportify World of Warcraft PvP? Like, I was watching the AWC, right, this Mm -hmm. weekend. So part of the reason I'm doing this now is because, like, it's a PvP weekend. We just had the World Championships. We just saw Mistweaver Monks win. Yay! Oh, yeah. We saw so many of them in the tournament. <laughs> um, and, uh, and, and I was wondering, like, I was watching it, and I was like, there's so many things here that I would change from a broadcaster perspective. But the, but the main problem is that the people that watch League of Legends and Overwatch and Dota are the people that play the game. Mm-hmm. And so the people who are going to watch, like, WoW PvP are going to be people, the people who play WoW PvP. Right, um, yeah. But like even as a person who plays WoW PvP, I can't tell at all what's going on oh. during an arena match at AWC. Yeah. When I watch yeah. a League of Legends game, and I'm like a let's say I'm like a silver level player, I mean mm-hmm. I've been higher ranked, but I'm not right now. Um, I can tell what's going on because you have this visual representation of like you have these people and they're kind of like doing something and doing something and they come together and then they're facing off and then there's five yeah. characters on screen on one team and they're all the same color and the other team and they're all the same color and they're like testing each other and then all of a sudden there's this massive like ah and they're like yeah. running into each yeah. other and then like three of them die and and two and then the other team five of them are alive and you're like somebody right. won somebody lost yeah you know kind of like what's going on and you can see this big climactic event yeah like, take place and you and even though you play league of legends like only the people who play league really watch league yeah but you can be as bad as you want you can still like participate anyone could understand in the understanding in the in the aspect of the game whereas like yeah. i feel like with wow pvp like that's not the case yeah um, i that actually reminds me when i i never play counter strike i play a little bit of counter strike like csgo but um the first tournament i watched i had no idea what was going i had no idea what was going on but i did know that someone on the other team just got shot and they died and now i see that everyone died so one one team wins so yeah um i actually think it's possible but i think it's with the rated battlegrounds and not arena which would be like the opposite end of what they've been doing i because it the same reason why i was what you just described and like how I first saw Counter-Strike, 
in RBGs, you don't need to know what's going on, but one team has a flag and one team doesn't. And this guy is really close to capping it. Or, you know, there's two people at a base and they're starting to get that base, only one person there, and they just got that base. I, I really, and it doesn't even need to be 10v10. It, I've, there's interesting, you know, 7v7 or 6v6 versions that people have floated around. And I think from like visually, I think Raider Battlegrounds sh- should be something that Blizzard should invest in or try to because I'm trying to think of like a good map. Um, yeah, the worst thing Gulch is a classic, you know, flag carry map. Each t- each team has a flag. It would be it would be it. like modern Overwatch. So when Overwatch first came right. out, they broadcast it like CS:GO. It was horrible mm-hmm. because you like yeah. you'd be watching from the pro- professional player's perspective, and these people's flicking is yeah. Like, you can't even tell what's going on for one I second couldn't, because their level is like too high. I tried to watch and I couldn't. Yeah. And now, if you watch it, it's like yeah. pure arena vision. They have yeah, it's like signifiers. They they're right. able to like they kind of like are able to signify when t- one team's doing a go yeah in a way because they'll have like they'll have like one team it's kind of like an energy bar like you'd see in a in a street fighter game or something like that when they yeah. all have their ultimates up at the same time it's like their team is like oh, yeah. powered up or whatever yeah um but the, they don't see that in the game but you see it as a broadcast or the, yeah. the, the things that they have done to make that more visible game is amazing yeah. but now nobody's watching it it's too late right right you know, but, yeah but like i guess the way that you're describing rbgs i can kind of imagine it in that perspective yeah like I- you don't have to be professional or even know what's going on to know, you know, there's a 2v1 going at this node on a Rathi Basin, you know, oh, they just got the flag. That's crazy. Like, maybe a pro would be like, would respect, oh, wow, the way that guy just CC'd that rogue or something and he was able to get the flag is insane. But even from a casual standpoint, they just capped the base. That's that's crazy. Now they're ahead. So, yeah. And then for Arena, it's, I, I, it's hard because there's a lot going on there's a lot going on six different people six different cooldowns the only objective is to kill the other team i it's it, it's kind of difficult if you don't really under like you don't have to know what's going on but it's kind of it's it's not as fun if you don't understand what's going on or what cooldowns are being traded i feel like they, they need to start with with visual clarity on the team situation yeah because i was constantly like when I was when I was really when I was really keyed into like who was on whose team, mm. it was really easy to kind of like take enjoyment out of realizing that there was a two v one happening or that somebody was isolated yeah. from their healer or whatnot. Right. But like that's actually very hard for the average player to see. Like it might be really easy for like a gladiator to see, like when you're just yeah. watching or you know the people. Right. But for somebody who's just tuning in and who's like played PvP for like you know a season like me, yeah. um, they're not even the same color. You know, they have like yeah. this very, very little thin bar about the, around the names, but then I just had to memorize like what classes were on which yeah. teams and what their names were. Yeah, uh, and then I couldn't, I couldn't even know who was who was winning or losing in any fight because they colored the the bars by the class. Yeah, so like you could right. see. But, yeah, but like so, so you don't know which priest is who. Like they could, they could just yeah. have everybody on one team chroma their armor green, and everybody yeah. on the team chroma their something armor like red. That. You know, something yeah. really simple. Yeah, yeah. Um, no, yeah, I, I get that. I could. I can totally understand that. It's really confusing. And then and then I guess like stealing from the Overwatch thing, like that seems like wow, PvP is centered around goes. So if they had mm-hmm. some way of communicating like which team had their resources up from the yeah. offensive perspective, they could get yeah. rid of a lot of the like the defensive stuff. I think in World of Warcraft they show they literally show just offensive cooldowns. Pretty much, they yeah. They're yeah. just like, okay, or y- y- this team has all of their offensive cooldowns up. They're ready yeah. to go, you know. And look at them setting yeah. up. Even at the uh, beginning of the interview, when you're like, oh, visually, are there certain cooldowns you can see through animations? They're really mostly just offensive cooldowns of animations. You know, combustion, somebody's on fire, warriors stomp the ground. But defensively, I mean, sure, mages have ice block, which you can kind of tell. But outside of that, it's kind of kind of difficult to tell. And, and, and nobody cares about off- defensive cooldowns. Like, they're not uh, fun for Pretty much, viewers. yeah. They're like, okay, yeah, exactly. like, who cares? Like, we don't need you to You want to see people, like, die. Yeah. yeah. Like, yeah. people are dying less slowly is not as fun as, like, seeing a new yeah. have his go and be on fire and, like, be Yeah, like, exactly. And then somebody interrupts it. You're like, oh, no. Right. You know, <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. <laughs> fall over. So they have, yeah. they have some of the clarity in the game. They just aren't highlighting mm-hmm. it or using it very well. Yeah, no, I agree. Yeah. Leg sweep is one of the best visual clarity. Oh, I love it. Like, ever. Yeah. 
It's just super cool. And you just spin around. I love it. And 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 everybody falls over. You know? Yeah, yeah. Like literally, <laughs> their character. Um. Uh, that was it. That was all that I had. Yeah. In terms of oh, like, wow. can we? What can we do to esportify? Wow. I mean, in-game participation is really the problem. Viewers are players. Yeah. So. Yeah. Without figuring out this how to woo people over to PvP. I mean, we only really talked yeah. about matchmake rating mm. uh, as a way of wooing people, like fixing the ranking system so that people play and making it more like public. But I don't yeah. know if there's other ways of encouraging participation. Yeah. I Maybe more rewards. I mean, maybe there's some more armor they could add at certain ratings. More than, Instead of just a higher item level on gear and more visuals. I, there's people that would do a lot of things for a mount. So maybe add a mount, a transmog, something to get more people, like people to play step games in. That are fun. So like that's true too. Is yeah. WoW PvP fun? And if not, why? Yeah, I it is fun, but there is a point where you're trying to learn or you're trying to push, and there are outliers. And if you and the, the changes to those outliers just aren't fast enough. And I feel like. You only have a certain amount of time to get people to like really enjoy arena and it, like one bad experience really turns people off. So, mm. you know, if, if you're not fixing the outliers fast enough, people are just going to not play it. Yeah. I'm trying to f think if I've experienced a lot, I guess, uh, yeah. I, I played PVP for like a week mm -hmm. uh, or two weeks in the launch of Shadowlands because the gear yeah. was necessary. And I was like, oh, I'll right. do it in arenas. And I died to <laughs> double druid and triple druid convoke yeah. Yeah. Uh, like 70 times in a row. Yeah. And then I was like, all right, I'm just going to play RBGs. Never yep. mind. And then I just yep. got my rating all through RBGs. And yeah, exactly. and then I came back to arenas this season and I haven't I haven't really encountered any misweavers. Mostly just been warriors. So, and yep. like mages. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But I feel like I've, monks are pretty decent at warriors and mages. Like maybe compared yeah. to like other healers, I don't. I don't really know. I don't play yeah. other healers. But I've, like I I've queued into more prop alleys than miss weavers. So, um, so yeah. I, maybe it doesn't feel as as annoying as uh, convoke did to me. But oh, um, I can yeah. understand that. Like there's that window where like I was gonna take it and try it out. Yeah. And then it's just right. like you run into these cheese comps and you're like, well, where's my druid? Exactly. Oh, right. Team, yeah. <laughs> we don't have one, so I guess we just lose. <laughs> we just lose. Yeah. I no, no, a hundred percent. And that's and then you get to a point where on the ladder, like even at high rating, um, you kinda get through a point where you're only playing against the best comps in the game. Jungle, Rogue Mage, Ret Warrior. And I'm that's it. That's all so I'm playing Thunder, which is one of the worst. I mean I'm playing Mistweaver Thunder even, which is even worse. And then I'm queuing into these tier one comps. And we just we just don't stand a chance, so, really. We so maybe the other aspect here is the problem, like in League of Legends and and Overwatch <laughs> and in CS:GO and Valorant, whatever. You can just like mm. you can just play the meta. You can just queue up one night and be like, "I'm gonna play absolutely, meta. I'm gonna play on." Yeah. Meta. So like, why don't why aren't we allowed to in PvP just queue up whatever we want and all of the gear and eye level is exactly the same no matter what. Yeah. And it's only yeah. skill expression. And then, and then yeah. you get your you get your gear to use out in RBGs or in the world PvP, mm -hmm. like to carry out of arena or something yeah. like that. But like maybe you, yeah. when you go into the arena, it's just you play whatever character you want for whatever meta you want, and the right. gear is identical across every single yeah. player in the arena. Yeah, there's a lot of people pushing for that, but then we get the response: "Oh, it's an MMO. You need to earn your gear." So, well, yeah, yeah, it's. But yeah, arena is and then an MMO. I mean, like it's right. like Smite. You know, it's like a right. it's like a um, MOBA, massive yeah. multiplayer and then, online battle arena. Another suggestion I saw, which I am a fan of, is making Alliance and Horde able to queue together. Which sure. why not? I kind sense. of enjoy that idea because you have the player base split in half essentially between Horde and Alliance. Half the people we can't even queue with. So I kind of like that idea. I feel I don't like know. that's the same queuing problem as the rating. So like I can yeah. only queue with Alliance. Right. Sorry, I'm Alliance actually. <laughs> Turns oh out. no. Oof. <laughs> I've always I <laughs> I started a Alliance character on Sargeras on the day that I bought the game 
in 2004 oh, when it came, the I, day it came out and i literally still just have an alliance character on Sargeras. i ra- i rated on alliance Sargeras for like legion and bfa okay all right we yeah run into each other then yeah uh yeah so so like i can only queue with like alliance and then i can only queue with people who are like kind of within my rating right and so they're like inventing all of these problems that don't exist and then like yeah creating them sustaining them right kind of so like yeah so you can only play with alliance who are above 2100 who have this gear and it has to be this comp or you're just not gonna win yeah. it's yeah it's 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 difficult yeah for sure i'm trying to think of how they could do that technically because like right now in the tournament realm you can create you have to like create it from the loading screen you have to create that character mm-hmm. that wouldn't yeah. fly it would have to be like in the queue you would pick, yeah. you would pick your class and subclass, and then it would load yeah. you into the arena, and it would remember your keybinds and and all of your talents and everything from the last time you set it up. Yeah, and you would just have to like if you were just getting a fresh character, you'd literally have to like throw all your skills on there right there. Or maybe yeah. they would add add a arena training setup mode where you could queue into an empty arena with any character, and there'd be target dummies. Yeah, and then you could so, like, set up your stuff and then queue into a real and arena. Yeah, in Wrath, they had servers called uh, the Tournament Realm, and you were able to make a character on the Tournament Realm, and they had vendors, and you just paid gold. Like, you just used gold to buy the highest item level gear, and then you just queued up. And that's how, that's what determined, that's who determined who got qualified for the tournaments, is who was the highest rated on the Tournament Realm ladder, rather than the uh, live server ladder. Right. And that way, you know, gear wasn't even. An issue, right? You, it was just whoever was the best. Expression. Yep, was the best. So yeah, I think they should yeah, consider like PvP a different game mode than yeah that, than a role playing game. It's not a role playing game if you're playing a mul- right. multiplayer online battle arena. Yeah, it's just no, I agree. And that way, you wouldn't have to uh, have you know balance changes for PVE and PvP. You could just focus on all right. These are the changes for PvP. Right. They don't affect PvE you at could all. Still, you could still earn items that you could go use in PvE. Mm-hmm. Yeah. People would people would play PvP just for that reason. Some people, yeah. not all of them. And yeah. the rest of them would play because it's fun and fair and competitive. Right. No, yeah, I agree. All right. Thanks, Justin. This is a really yeah. uh, insightful interview, and I love how many tools you have um, <laughs> that are like similar to other MOBA players. Now that now that I'm kind of like seeing the parallels with I, I mean mm. literally it's a MOBA right it came from Warcraft three, which yeah. was which was itself like turned in, accidentally turned into a MOBA by the people who made Dota, <laughs> so it kind of like it kind of like makes sense that the things that you have like having these like mini games that you focus on when you're training and and all of these like translatable skills like are the same as what League players use to get good. Um, I should start playing League. You'd probably be really good at it. You'd probably be <laughs> way too good at it. I feel like uh, yeah. Arena is a lot harder than League of Legends, to be yeah. honest. Uh, it's the same kind of like chain of effects, except that the most important skill is damage prediction. Uh, and mm-hmm. you have to feel that okay. like in your body. Kind of the same as Arena. You know, It's just that okay, yeah. Riot has very su- successfully extended out fights. So like, there's not okay. as much one-shotting going on. You have more time to react um, oh, okay. than you do in, in World of Warcraft Arena. I feel oh, like. yeah. 